listeners there. Uh, permit me to take the delight in welcoming you all very warmly to this conference on private banking and wealth management. The world is facing a, 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 a pandemic that manifests both as a health challenge and also as a, an economic challenge as well. Nigeria is particularly impacted given the poor health infrastructure in the country, as well as the lack of fiscal buffers to hedge against what is perhaps the most severe revenue crisis that this country has seen in our lifetime. We are very delighted at Business Day to be presenting such an array of panelists and speakers in the course of our three sessions for today's event. Business Day, as you would imagine, is the premier provider of business and financial intelligence in Nigeria. And so we thought it wise that at a time of such drastic economic crisis, that we bring SPACs like you together to share very critical insights on what is happening in the private banking and world management space. We are aware, for instance, that at a time like this, some people are making money some are losing money. But for you as wealth managers, you are also faced with an opportunity to distinguish yourselves and your business, and of course, to confirm your business models. I am not an expert, so I am going to give way very quickly. But before I do that, let me say, as I already alluded to, that this today we will be having three sessions um, and um, the first is titled cockpit where we will be reviewing the tracks that we see in the landscape before i go and before i yield the microphone to the moderator for the first session let me extend business days Gratitude to our partners and sponsors, including Investment One, Sankore Investment, Platform Capital, Blackbridge Wealth, Aiko Capital, and of course our friends Martin and Bing Bay who have joined us from outside of the country. I think at this point, let me very quickly invite Yewende, our friend, who is a partner with the law firm Olaniu Ajayi LLP, and she will be the moderator for the first session. Yewende, over to you, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibogon. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, as has been said, the world is indeed witnessing an unprecedented health crisis brought about by the coronavirus pandemic. And of course, this has grave consequences for economies across the globe. According to reports coming out of the IMF, OECD, and the World Economic Forum, the impact of the pandemic is likely to pose significant threats to global stability financially. And there is no doubt that the impact on Africa is going to be monumental. Indeed, the latest report from the IMF suggests that economic growth for Sub-Saharan Africa is supposed to decline from positive position of 2.4% at the end of 2019 to negative 2.1 to negative 5.1% by the end of 2020. That being said, there is no telling how far reaching the impact of the pandemic itself is going to be on all our economies. 
There is thus no better time to have a conversation on wealth management and private banking as now. And I thank Business Day for putting together this dialogue. For the session this morning, our aim will be to get our distinguished panelists to share their thoughts and perspectives on some of the challenges that the pandemic has brought about for the wealth management sector. But beyond that, they would also The world is witnessing an unprecedented health crisis brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, with grave consequences for economies, industries, and the service sectors. The impact of the global spread of COVID-19 has heightened market risk in ways not seen since the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2008. It's clear that this impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on global economies is yet to be ascertainable. The impact of percent to 5.1% negative growth for as part of Africa, wealth management and private banking, a very team for putting this dialogue together. In recognition of the fact that global investment management as well as private wealth is one of a global nature, our panelists have been drawn from different parts of the countries that we have playing in the space of wealth management. We have three distinguished panelists this morning, one joining us from London, another one from Switzerland, and we have our last panelist from Nigeria. Our first panelist is a lawyer of repute, duly qualified in Nigeria and London with over 30 years combined experience. Mrs. Bingpe Unkochu is our first panelist for the day. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Our next panelist is Dr. Akintoye Akindele, a seasoned strategist and investor with a demonstrable track record of identifying opportunities in high growth sectors and accessing capital for growth. He brings to bear his wealth of experience and will be speaking to us about the Nigerian landscape and his experience as a wealth advisor also. Our third panelist is Martin Modi. He is partner and co-founder of Africa Wealth Partners, a Swiss-based leading independent wealth management firm with a focus on the business and capital needs of African entrepreneurs. Thank you, panelists, for joining us this morning. That, I would like to ask each of you to please, in 30 seconds, just tell us about yourselves briefly. Ms. Nkotu, please. Uh, good morning, and thank you again, Iwande. Thank you, Business Day, for um, inviting me onto the panel. I'm talking, speaking to you from London, where I'm based. I currently um, run a, a multifamily office platform called W8 Advisory, which I established about five years ago after I had been practicing law here uh, for about 15 years. Uh, like Niondi said, I'm a lawyer by background. I'm still a practicing barrister, but I found that in the private wealth space needed um, a trusted advisor, someone who, who actually could work with clients uh, to take a holistic view of their wealth, to help with the wealth structuring and tax planning. And I also have um, established an asset management company, which is FCA regulated in London, called W8 Wealth, and with my asset management partners, who I um, founded the company with, we also help clients with investment management mandates and financial planning, and also looking at their global uh, wealth portfolio. And uh, that's me, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Kindele, please. Uh, good morning again, and thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Dr. Kindele, I'm based in Lagos. Um, so I, I, I work for Platform Capital. Um, where we 
basically invest. We are stage agnostic, size agnostic, region agnostic, for growth market investor. We invest in businesses across all stages, all styles, all, and all, um, all sectors. Our thesis is basically looking at investments that benefit Africa, either taking African investments out or bringing, up in, or bringing investments uh, that benefit Africa in. Uh, we currently have over, across our portfolio, over 71 companies across the globe, and offices in Latin America, Asia, Europe, and, and the US and Africa itself. And, and, and I'm pleased to be here to share with you the trends we are seeing across the, uh, the COVID impact on our portfolio and actually how we are bullish on the Nigerian economy. I think COVID has been a very good thing for us and our portfolio says that. So I'm a bit, a bit, a bit contrarian on this segment. Thank you very much. Martin. Good morning, all. Greetings from Switzerland. Uh, my name is Martin Amodi, and let me say before I start, I am not from Anambra State, Onitsha, as many of you would think. I think if you see the visual, that makes it pretty clear. I am the co-founder of Africa Wealth Partners. We are uh, like Bimpe, a multi-family office and advisory boutique. Uh, we work with African families and executives, professionals. Um, when I say Africa, it's in fact our strong focus is on, on Nigeria. Um, I've been to Nigeria many, many times. Um, uh, I think it's over 85 times. Um, I, I typically spend a week a month in Lagos. Now it seems like I spend a week a month on Zoom. Um, my daughter thinks I, I run a, a call center out of our house. Um, but it, we are um, um, very similar to, to, to Bimpe, uh, independent advisors, and, and try to help our other families we work with to navigate the ever more challenging landscape of uh, financial services. I'm very happy to be here today and looking forward to exchanging and giving my kind of outside in view from Switzerland into Nigeria. So thank you very much for joining us. So. <coughs> thank you once again to all our panelists. Um, before we go into the questions, just to remind our attendees, please send your questions by visiting www.slido.com using the Slido code, hashtag And when you are sending your questions, please remember to indicate the name of the person who will answering each question that you post. Each question that you post. Moving on to other questions. The concept of private wealth management is one that dates back to more than a century with very well-driving objectives from estate and planning to succession, family governance, and other factors that would typically trigger the need for private wealth management. Globally, there are estimated 89 trillion US dollars worth of assets under management as at the end of 2019. And this is predicted to grow to about 110 trillion US dollars by the end of 2020. With that in mind, how would you rate the wealth management landscape in Nigeria? Would you say it has matured? Would you say that there is enough awareness? Or would you say that it's still in its nascent stages? Right. Um, I, I know there's, a really, there's an echo. I'm not sure whether it's all of us that are getting the echo. Um, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Uh, I'll just to tackle your question. Right. When we, I know in somehow I feel that the world's wealth management are very loosely. Um, and in, you know, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at this. Can, uh, right. I can see, I can hear myself echoing. I hope that's not affecting the quality of. Um, I'll start again. So when, when we say wealth management, I, I, I find that a lot of um, clients or people I talk to tend to use it interchangeably with private banking. And I think it's probably a good idea to very quickly touch on the fact that there is a, a big difference between private banking and wealth management. Uh, what I see happening in Nigeria is that private banking in Nigeria is, you know, I would say is well established. Um, the, most banks will offer a premier service to clients. Uh, whether from premises that are a bit more luxurious with um, staff on hand that are obviously trained to be a bit more sensitive and a bit more um, aware of the client's needs. And, and the, 
last client is doing their banking, um, obviously the Paris banking will obviously advance, you know, extend more courtesies, more products to the client. That's very banking and it's done quite well in Nigeria. What I would say about wealth management in Nigeria, it's, it's really still in its, I would say, infancy, still in a fledging state. Um, when I, I sit in London and I, in the landscape of wealth management practiced by the global banks, what that really means is not just talking to a client about their financial needs, um, their products or their investments, but really having a view of the client's, I would say, lifestyle, really looking across everything the client is doing, right from the, obviously the assets, the financial assets that they own, but also looking at their non-financial assets, looking at how the assets are structured, looking at their tax planning. A lot of the Nigerian clients are international families with children and homes in at least you know, one other destination from Nigeria, if not two others, whether the US, South Africa, or the UK, or Dubai, you know, we, we, we tend to, to travel and we tend to put down roots, especially where we want to educate our children. So a wealth manager needs to, will be looking at your global portfolio, looking at your global requirements, looking at your non-financial requirements, real estate, even looking at the way your family is developing, because that's part of your investment. And also looking at structures that we can set up to hold those assets, efficiently from a tax point of view, and structures that also will help you in your estate planning. So the banks in Nigeria, I think when they say they offer wealth management, my experience has been private banking is well established, but wealth management, which I would say needs to include a whole suite of services, which doesn't just touch on the client's domestic portfolio, but touches on the client's international portfolio, wherever they go, wherever they are, is what wealth management is about. And that I find is still it's still a starting point. And, and that's why you see that I would say most of Nigerian clients rely still quite heavily on international advisors um, because you know the, I would say the, the uh, DNA, the ethos of wealth management is better established internationally in Switzerland, in the UK, um, even in the US. So that, that's, I, I, and that sort of gives you a, a picture of where I feel the landscape is still evolving and hopefully with COVID-19, I think many of the private banks are going to have to step up to really start helping and, and having a, a clearer discourse around what it means to be a wealth manager. Thank you very much. Dr. Kendele, do you share the same sentiments? Well, uh, thank you. I think, um, I mean, if you don't mind, I, I want to take a step back into that question. Um, wealth management, has two words, wealth and management. And in there lies the problem of the question you have asked me. The way we define wealth and where we manage wealth. So first, I think let's first take a step back to ask ourselves, is wealth the same way as described in Africa, Nigeria, or and the same in Europe and America? Given our history, given our informal sector, given our sector and GDP breakdown, so let me give you some numbers, for example, so that you put in perspective before we go into wealth management. Globally, the ultra wealthy, who are those that require wealth management mostly, have most of their portfolio in real estate. 27% of their portfolio is real estate. 23% of their portfolio is in equities. 17% of their portfolio is in fixed income. 11% in cash and currencies. And then they have 8% in private equity. That is what breaks down for the wealth as allocation is. If you then look at that and say in Nigeria, compare our listed markets where the top companies in Nigeria are not even listed. They are private companies. The biggest company in Nigeria, most of them are private companies. That's one. Most of the real estate we have in Nigeria are not even documented or have proper title. We have land use act related issues. That is two that, that limit that. Three, if you take a proxy of the mutual fund markets, 76% of mutual fund that at, at the last, as of June, was at 1.2 trillion, is in tr fixed income and treasury bills. So obviously, if one, wealth management requires us to manage assets that are well-defined in Europe and America, with structures and systems in place, with, like, 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 my, my, like my family said, with tax, with everything in place, defined at clearly, and then, wealth or asset classes that are different. In Nigeria, it becomes to struggle why you see wealth management, you will struggle if you pick a cut and paste approach 
from what is done abroad to Nigeria because our wealth is defined, defined differently. We have a lot of wealth locked up in real estate and land banks that were not unlocking. We have a lot of wealth trapped in private equity companies that are not being unlocked. We have a lot of wealth trapped in people's cash and, 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 and they're under their, under their bed, beds and tables. So first thing I want to first say is, our view as platform is very different to other firms on what we call wealth management. And that's why I think we've been able to grow our business significantly in the last one year, significantly fold because we then customize wealth management for African families or African investors to consider what their, their wealth is. First define what makes up their asset class or their, or their networks, then help them find ways to manage it. And I must say to you, that has grown. So I'll give you classic examples. Well, earlier on, somebody has said that people were looking to move their money into dollar and, and, and dollar for devaluation risk. We see that risk, we understand it, but there are growth markets in Nigeria that need Naira. So we've gone long on Naira in certain positions such so that people that have Naira, who don't have any dollar exposure, they don't have kids abroad, they don't have dollar needs, are able to put their Naira into opportunities that we see in Africa and they've grown significantly. Our portfolio has grown 20% this, during COVID. Because, so for people that have Naira assets, who have Naira needs, we're able to match those Naira needs with Naira opportunities. For people that have Naira assets, who need have dollar, dollar needs, we're able to help them find instruments to match that and vice versa. So for me, I think the first thing I want to make very clearly is I don't believe in a one size fits all definition of wealth management. I've raised money globally. I've managed money for institutional investors, the World Bank, the IFC, the CDC, the EIB. I've managed money for a lot of institutional investors. I mean, as many we built the biggest asset manager in middle Africa. So I understand that. I've done investment banking, I understand that. But what we found is that there's a massive gap in understanding of wealth management in Africa, and we are focused on that. And I think it's growing, there's an opportunity there, and it's a great chance for finance people to grow the market and make it scalable. Thank you very much for your contribution, Dr. Akindele. It's interesting that you touched on the dynamics of um, the wealth management sector in Nigeria vis-a-vis -vis other markets. Um, Martin, I would like you to share with us. Um, you are quite familiar with the African landscape. You have a lot of uh, clients in Nigeria and you have been here virtually every month for several years. And um, what has been your experience in relation to the asset portfolio that is available for clients? What has been the challenges that your clients face in finding assets to invest in locally vis-a-vis -vis opportunities available to them in other jurisdictions? No, no, thank you for that. And, and I, I only want to echo what uh, both Bimpe and Dr. Akindele have said. Um, I like very much the way you put it, Dr. Akindele, in terms of the uh, Nigerian asset allocation. Let me maybe uh, pick up on that. If I look at the people I deal with, and you'd be very, very surprised to hear the following. Most of the people I deal with have very little liquid assets. So most of the people I deal with have a very large family business. We always take a total wealth uh, approach. We are, um, I have a banking background, so I understand, and also the, this, how you distinguish Bimpe, the difference between private banking and wealth management, because in the old days, it was about the liquid assets, mostly the international side. Today, we take a total wealth um, approach. So I can only echo that. I think that's that's super important. What are the things we are, we are seeing? Um, um, one of the figures you shared before this session is that um, apparently 17% of the wealth of Nigerian is invested outside. Actually, that's not a picture we're seeing at all. We're seeing a very different picture, which is much more extreme. And I can say I've talked to hundreds of top Nigerian families. Um, uh, people tend to be, and this is a global phenomenon, over-invested in their home country. This applies whether you're Nigerian, Brazilian, Swiss, French. So obviously if you're, a lot of the wealth is entrepreneurial wealth and that's how you create your wealth. So obviously that you're gonna have a huge exposure to Nigeria. 
Um, so we always take a, a, a global a global look. Um, so so the diversification is the number one issue we're always facing: over concentration, sectoral over concentration, uh, sec, um, over concentration in asset class, over concentration in country, over concentration in currency. And I would say 99 out of 100 people we're talking to have that um, challenge. Now this is a dual-edged sword because also by being over concentrated, typically if I think of one of our large clients, it's a very well-known family business in Nigeria. That's how they created their wealth because they built their business they built it very successfully and that's how they became wealthier and wealthier and wealthier but there is a point where i think you need to look at this um in a total constellation and make sure you're you're diversifying properly so that's 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 one one of the topics and i i also totally agree with um dr akindela's view in the sense of um my point is not to say oh now you need to take all the money out of nigeria not at all nigeria the reason i put my business as a probably one of the few <laughs> panelist here is non-Nigerian, natively Nigerian, non-African native in Nigeria. Is I have a huge belief. I think Nigeria is one of the most interesting countries, despite all the noise and all of that. So I think you should be super exposed to Nigeria. My argument is just you need to be diversified. But you don't, if you don't like international, look at Africa, look at neighboring countries, just don't put all your eggs in, in the basket. So this is point number one. Point number two we're seeing, which I'm sure my, my esteemed colleagues also are seeing, is a liquidity. A lot of Nigerian Nigerians, I would say, are riding a very tight line on liquidity. So I meet a lot of people. Most of the people I meet are asset rich, but cash poor. Now, this is interesting and great. And I, you know, you could say it's it's a brave um, um, approach to have, but it can also very quickly get, get very risky. So we're also trying to help our clients to, to basically cash plan. Um, because, you know, as we see with the current crisis, if you would have spoken a year ago, nobody could predict this where we are right now, but it still happens. So you need to be prepared for those situations. So in summary, I would say there's two things diversification and liquidity where we're looking at very useful points interestingly we've uh, received a question from one of our attendees which ties in with the contribution of dr akindeli you did mention that um, one of the key things you've done at platform is to ensure a matching of the lifestyle and earnings of your clients with the investment opportunities that you advise them on, ensuring that they can they can take position because they do not have any foreign dollar dealings. And so um, the question we've been asked is, what would you recommend, which asset classes would you recommend for diversification, which also ties in with um, Martin's contribution over a three to five year time frame? One of our attendees has asked that question based on your Nigerian clients, for instance, what asset classes would you be recommending to them, bearing in mind the current state of play, looking at devaluation for Naira, as well as um, the need for them to find alternative assets. We've talked about the stock market and the depletion in terms of... I think you're muted. Yeah, Randy, I didn't hear anything you said. Was the question for me? I didn't hear anything you said at all. Yes, I was just I can't reading out. Hear. Can you, can hear, you me? hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you for some reason. So can you unmute and mute again and try? Can you hear me now? Hello, you and me. I can hear you very clearly. Can't. Something is wrong with this. Um... Can you hear me? Let me try and log in again. I can't hear. Um... Okay. All right. I will just go on to the next panelist. Mrs. Okochi, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, having looked at the issues with opportunities for investment for our clients, um, I would like to ask you, 
based on the restrictions that we've experienced and the lockdown orders across various jurisdictions, how has it been managing your clients' expectations, bearing in mind that this sector is one that thrives heavily on personal interface and face-to-face -face interactions between clients and wealth management advisors? What innovative ways have you had to deploy in rendering service and ensuring that your client's confidence is maintained? Yes, that's been an interesting, interesting journey. But I, I mean, let me just first start by saying, you know, I live in the UK, but I, I believe I work, I work on the continent of Africa. I mean, my client base is uh, African families, uh, predominantly Nigerian. Um, I also have clients in other West African countries like Ghana and a couple of Francophone countries because I'm, I'm Francophone to a certain extent. So I've had to travel a lot. That was always my, my pattern. Even when I ran the law firm, I mean, my firm was again, a very much an African niche practice. I was on the plane pretty much every other month. And in this, this year, just before the lockdown, I've been in Nigeria three times before the middle of March. And so that was what my clients expected. It's just like Martin mentioned, um, it was easier, better. You, you, got, you got a richer conversation when you visited clients and spent the hours that you needed. Um, now we've obviously all been restricted from traveling and we've all, I would say, come, come to live our lives online. We are definitely now very much more uh, adept at using all digital tools from Zoom to Microsoft Team to Skype to, I even had a call on a, with a client on Facebook Messenger the other day, didn't realize that was an, <laughs> one of the avenues. And, and yes, I mean, thank goodness that we can have video calls because I think a, a video call is still important in making the client feel connected, uh, making the client, you know, you, you look at the nuances, look at the body language, the facial expressions are, are all needed to be able to communicate properly. So we've all very much been working in the digital space. But let me also um, add the fact that I believe that current um, you know, situation, the pandemic has also brought a lot more um, attention to personal affairs. I see um, a lot of my uh, Nigerian clients who I would fly into Lagos, would book a meeting, would have to you know, reschedule three times. I usually would spend about two weeks to make sure I was able to see the clients just because they were busy. We're all busy, you know, meetings, hosting, traveling, Abuja today, London for 24 hours. We're all at home. And actually a lot of the messaging that I've been working on, which has to do with the wealth management of the wealth, no matter where the wealth is, whether it's fixed income, whether it's bonds, whether it's, you know, um, euro bonds, cash, real estate, art collections, whatever the clients own, whatever they've worked hard and, and whatever wealth they've used the money to amass, they need to make sure, first of all, they've planned it, they've structured it in a tax efficient manner. They also are thinking very much about the time when they're not here, about estate planning, about you know, the, the needs to um, transition the wealth to the next generation in a conflict free way. I'm a lawyer and I spent the first 15 years of practice in this country when I moved here. In 1995, having practiced in Nigeria, I practiced for about 10 years before I moved here in Nigeria. I found I was doing a lot of contentious probate. I was in the UK courts a lot, English courts a lot for Nigerian families who had in disputes over assets after the deceased of, you know, a founder owner, generation one. And that's part of, part of the motivation to setting this platform up was to help to guide the client to say, whatever you've, you've, um, you've bought, whatever you own, you need to structure tax efficiently, but also look at estate planning. So all of these conversations can now take place online. People are, are much more aware of, I would say, the fact that we're not here forever. I mean, it's always been a taboo to talk about death, but unfortunately COVID-19 has brought that reality much closer to a lot of us. I've lost members of my family in Nigeria, unfortunately, due to COVID as well. And so we're all very much aware. And I think clients are much more reflective and actually much more willing to engage even online. Gone are the days when they'd wait for me to get on the plane and see them. Now there's an urgency in dealing with our affairs. And yes, we're all using digital space. The other area that I've also um, expanded the business into in the digital banner is also allowing clients to have a digital tool. Now, the next generation, I'm sure we'll touch on that later, uh, the younger generation, the millennials who want to also start to create wealth, invest, and also you know, save for long term, are looking at they want a quick fix. They want instant gratification. They want to be able to check their portfolios online, on their phones, on apps. And I'm developing something in that area. So uh, I mentioned the company that I own, which is WH Wealth, which is FC regulated. 
I'm also developing an online tool called Wealth8, which will be um, ready by the end of August. We already have a website. If you go to wealth8.com, wealth8.com, you already will hear about this tool that's really designed to focus on millennials and African women, because I feel women are underserved, and helping them to understand the language of investment, financial literacy, but also to start to invest their money from as low a level as 500 pounds, rather than wait for the day when they all think they have to be rich to invest. So the digital space is very useful, both for conversations and both for investment tools. And, and like I said, Wealth is an investment tool that will be launched probably by the end of August to encourage youngsters and women and millennials and everyone, because we'll start from 500 pounds to whatever level, to invest online in managed funds, which will be you know, managed funds. Uh, we will actually uh, source the funds from the likes of BlackRock and, and big names out there. So that's in a nutshell, the fact that I think the digital space has become a, a very handy and indispensable tool to wealth managers worldwide. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Key things you from your contribution. Um, I can hear you guys. In, so, sorry, Dr. Kandela, were you speaking? I can hear you guys now, so sorry. I, I lost the voice for a while, so. I'm no back. problem, I'll come back to you just in a bit. So I was just trying to highlight some key points emanating from Mrs. Mpoche's contributions, and that's the issue of uh, financial literacy, as well as the need for proper governance in family affairs. And um, that takes me back to you, Dr. Akindele, and the question that I had asked you earlier. And it's interesting, a number of questions are coming in from the participants with respect to where exactly, what are the asset classes that investors should be considering for purpose of diversifying their portfolio, particularly bearing in mind the landscape currently for a three to five year plan. And another person has asked another question related to that, that what type of um, services would combine well for the purpose of investment banking? I think basically our participants are trying to understand what types of assets should they be looking at for the purpose of managing their wealth? Uh, so that's, that's, a pretty, um, that's a pretty long question that requires a whole day to answer, but I'll try it very short because we don't have time. First is, um, to answer a question on asset class people should invest in, there are two key things you must first address. There are risk tolerance and their return expectations. Your risk tolerance determines what kind of risk you are willing to take. And that has a lot of factors. And age is one of your factor. Your stage in life is one of the factor. Your type of, uh, your experience of taking risk is a factor. You have other considerations like tax, like other, other things, that's one. Two, also what sort of um, asset do you already have? So are you already heavy in real estate or you have an equity? So that is first, that goes to determine what your risk tolerance is. Then look at what your return expectations are. So I'll give you an example. If a 40 year old wants to retire at 60, and let's say today, by the time he put all his assets together, his stock, bonds, everything is worth $100,000. He wants to be worth $2 million when he's 60. That means a Kega or an compound amount gold is over 50% year on year, over 20 years. That will inform the kind of risk he can take, whether it's equities, whether it's derivatives, whether it's fixed income, or what it is. So first is, those are first key things that people must face figure. What risk, what's my risk tolerance? What's my time horizon? What is my wealth target? And what my return expectation? With that in mind, you then build a portfolio that considers all asset classes. There are four quadrants to asset classes. There is the safe, safe quadrant, which is the fixed income quadrant. That has treasury bills, uh, bonds, and, 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 and fixed income, which is fairly safe. They are coupon based, they give you yield, but they are, like you, both of us know, they're exposed to it. That, like most people know, they have inflation, and not, they have inflation, and even though they have some risk. They have the real estate quadrant that is a good store of wealth, may not create a lot of wealth depending on inflation and currency devaluation. So, for example, if you bought a house in Nigeria five years ago, one dollar was, um, was it 120 or 150, now at 500 million naira, and that means it was three million dollar house. Today, your house is a million dollar house. So, in Naira, you have, you have made money in dollar, you've lost some of your value. So again, that determines on what it is. But the state Nigeria is, without boring you too much, 
We have seen lots of opportunities in Hello? not just in they are also are performing the valuation risk. Um, I'll take food value chain, for example, agri food value chain. There are so many opportunities in the agri food value chain from storage to financing agriculture to basic from food for food that you can tap into at various stages from ideation to scale that are delivering above average returns. If you take power, there are various power solutions from solar to gas to power that will give you consistent returns. If you take tech, even on tech on its own, I don't like to say uh, FinTech, because everybody uses FinTech as a buzzword. FinTech itself is just financial and technology play. It means that what solution are you solving? There are great plays we are seeing in people either solving merchant solution or commerce solutions or connection solutions or logistics. We are seeing strong plays there. Education, major, major area we are seeing growth in. With the, with the use of technology, with the use of, with the stay at home and remote working, we are seeing major changes in how people are learning, acquiring new skills that, are, that, 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 that promises return. And even the one that a lot of people may not think about, real estate. We think real estate market will grow in certain areas, while other areas will suffer. Because as you start working from home, for example, if I'm working from home, then why am I living in Ikoi? I can live in, I can live, I can live in Ekwe and have good internet. So we see areas, suburb areas starting attract, attracting capital to give lifestyle standards of living that will enable work from home better while reducing pressure on the ultra high um, urban areas. So that various sectors, again, depending on your time horizon, depending on your appetite, depending on, your, on the stage you are in life, depending on the return you are looking for, there are great opportunities. We've worked with our investors. We have a, well, and, and, and before I wrap up, we have a lot of investors who are transiting from professionals into entrepreneurs. We are helping them manage that transition better. We are seeing Thank you very much, Dr. Akindele. Um, I think moving on, Quickly, um, Martin, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just touching on the point of governance with respect to succession planning. Now, clearly one of the things that we realize and experience in this part is the reluctance of the patriarchs of families from you know, letting go of control. And oftentimes without proper governance in place, what you find and statistics have shown that only 30% of family owned businesses get passed down from first generation to second generation and the percentage decreases as it goes further down the line. From that perspective, what role do you think that um, family governance, what role should that be playing and how should wealth advisors be advocating family governance as a tool to wealth management. No, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that question. That's um, a very, very important topic, and I'm very happy, happy to speak on that. Um, look, from my experience, if if you look at um, some of the the key families, the, the the typical wealthy families of Nigeria today, and you look at the the age bracket of the patriarchs, many of them are coming into their 60s, 70s, even 80s. And <clears throat> what, what I see as commonality, they start to realize uh, the sad things, they're not gonna live forever. Uh, they built against very um, tough odds, amazing businesses, but, um, and, and they're super passionate about making sure that um, the, the family success is not what one would call a one trick pony, which is one generation, as you said. And the numbers, by the way, you shared, they are global numbers. These are not Nigerian numbers. This is a, a typical global. So the problem of family transition is not a Nigerian problem. I would, I would argue it's probably even more important in a Nigerian and African context because so much of the economy is built on, on, on family, on successful family businesses. 
And um, um, just to share a very interesting example, we did a year ago uh, in partnership with Lagos Business School, Pascal Dozier and John Davis, uh, Professor John Davis, who's um, an authority in this field, had a, a one day session in, in Lagos Business School. And in preparation of that session, I sat with Mr. Dozier, who you know is now in his early 80s. And he said to me, Martin, you know, why this topic is so important for Nigeria? If I talk to young Nigerians today about the families of my youth, they would look at me like I spoke Chinese because, and I said, why is that Mr. Dozi? He said, because these families are all gone. So this really underscores the importance for the Nigerian economy to support those important families in this transition. In my experience also, while I think everybody's keen on looking on the next investment opportunities and all of these interesting topics we're discussing now, if you really want to get the interest of the patriarch, from my personal experience, you, you come with this topic because if we're realistic, and maybe if I exaggerate a bit, but what happens if the patriarch wakes up at night? He doesn't think about his family. He doesn't think about his wife. He doesn't think about his dog. He thinks about his business because that's his baby. Again, I'm exaggerating, but he's been nurturing for his whole life. So if somebody can approach the patriarch and have a conversation and support him in this generational shift, it's ultra important. Second point here, again, just to share some of our, of our experiences, very often when we engage the more prominent families families of Nigeria, we're not being brought in by the patriarch. Um, we're often being brought in by the second generation. I would say not often, I would say it's almost always the case. Why is that? Because very often, what do you do if you have um, a certain degree of wealth? You want to give your kids the best education. So they've all been educated in private schools uh, where Bimpe lives, and then they moved on to the US and on their MBA, come back to Nigeria. Now you have two generations starting to work together. And that's, that's not always easy, even if the best intentions are there. Um, so very often, um, it's also quite important um, because it's, this is not about logic or, or, or practice. Pragmatism. This is about emotions very often, and particularly, you know, um, I, I recall a situation. I, I, I'm not obviously not going to mention who it is, but one of the most well-known Nigerian entrepreneurs, and we were talking about this. He was adamant that he was the only one who knew how to run his business, and his children. Again, I'm exaggerating; are all idiots. And I said to him, "Sir, if I may paint an analogy, what do you think? It's like you have a vintage car." If you never let your, your, your son drive your vintage car, what do you think is going to happen the second you go to the place where we'll all eventually meet? He's going to take your vintage car for a spin in Lagos and he's going to crash it into the first wall because he never, you never taught him how to drive the car. What if you take him when he's 18 and say, now, son, you're not going to drive my car, but I'm going to take you on the Sunday when there's no traffic in Lagos, going to show you the car. I'm going to gradually introduce you to the car. I'm going to give you a seat at the table. When you go, he's going to feel such an obligation to you because you entrusted him. You took him seriously. You took him, you gave him a seat at the table. Um, so the topic I could go on, this is similar to the topic you just asked, Dr. Dr. Akindele. It's a topic I could talk endlessly about, but it's an ultra, ultra important topic. And um, I would say there is huge, huge interest from families to work on that topic. We're working with several families right now, you know, drafting family constitution, family governance, because the separation of business and family interests, which are often not always 100% aligned, can be conflicting, is, is really important. Um, so my advice to wealth managers today to, would be that this is a topic you really need to talk to your clients about. Thank you, Martin. Very quickly, we have um, some questions from participants. Um, our panelists are being asked, do you currently and actively take sustainable development into consideration when advising your clients? So if you could just speak you in 30 seconds very quickly martin starting with you is sustainable development a key um, consideration when you're advising your clients it, it it is and i i would argue um it is and it isn't it is in the sense that i think all our clients are doing when they're active as entrepreneurs in africa west africa nigeria the continent it always has a sustainability element to it so it's 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 always there but it's something almost which we don't need to talk about because everybody um dr akindele talked about um the opportunities in clean in clean tech um it's built into the topic by default so absolutely mrs onkachu um yes it, it is a conversation i have to say it's even more important to the i would say the millennials the younger generation uh, who are very exposed who are well traveled and who see the need to really that the world has to really that being um, held accountable in various areas. And so, yes, there's a, there's a question, but in some cases, you know, the client will be investing directly, say, for example, as a private equity deal, 
in say you know a clean energy company or, or, or something to do in, in the agricultural food security sector. In some cases, uh, other cases where clients funds are sitting you know in a managed fund, clients will still want to know: Can you unpack that managed fund? And can I see what kind or what are the underlying um, investments that that managed fund has? You know, what sort of companies have they invested in? And in some cases, if they feel there's something in there that actually totally is not aligned with their interest, they will say, no, I actually, oh, I want to insist that the fund we're investing in has a good SDG rating. And, you know, sustainable goals are not just about clean energy, but even about everything from gender equality, human rights, you know, um, employment creation, food security. So it's a lot of funds these days, they will publish the information about their rating, um, you know, as, as far as the um, SDG goals are concerned. Okay, Dr. Kindele, very quickly. Okay, so, I mean, it's at, it's at the core of our investment thesis and strategy. I think if you invest in Africa, you have to, you have to be focused about it. What I say to people right now, actually, that actually investing in Africa is about investing in sustainability anyway. Um, so it's... Um, investing in Africa is about investing in sustainability anyway. So investing in Africa is important. We look at all the... I mean, for us, very important. All the areas we're investing in, whether it's agri or tech or financial services, look at stability, which is why we deploy 15 year capital. We don't deploy the capital to 15 years. Follow it, we measure it, and we're trying to ensure that it's something that is sustainable. Thank you very much to our panelists. I'm afraid we will have to draw this for our conversation here. It has been a very insightful and um, interesting discussion. I think what some of the key things that have emanated from our discussion is this. There are still opportunities for investment in Nigeria, in Naira, and as well as the need for diversification from a portfolio risk management perspective. And so for the savvy investors, our panelists have already um, shared with us insights into how you can take advantage of local assets as well as foreign assets in ensuring that you are able to drive growth from your portfolio management. In addition to that, we have also been told that there is a need for families to ensure that there is proper planning for succession within their family businesses. But not just that, there must also be put in place family governance schemes that ensures that wealth is passed on from one generation to the other. Um, I think um, another thing we've heard is the need for innovation for wealth advisors and ensuring that in advising their clients, they take on board the shifting demographics of clientele from the older generation to the younger ones and bear in mind the dynamics of that particular class of clientele and tailor the asset and the options and models for wealth advisors to those category of clientele to ensure that whatever is offered to them is purpose, purposeful and um, it's custom and tailored to their expectations. At this point in time, I'll thank you once again, all our participants and hand over to the host. Thank you very much. speakers thank you to the moderator for guiding us on that very interesting session we learned a lot and it's been a very interesting 55 minutes we want to thank everyone we will be moving on to the next panel session shortly we would like to encourage all the speakers on this session to turn on their videos and their audios as they will be coming on very soon I would like to introduce the moderator for the next session, Fumi Olani, who is the manager at Private World Services at Anderson Task. She will be leading the next session. She'll be coming up shortly to introduce the speaker and guide the session.
Thank you so much, Rolly. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fumi Olani, as rightly put um, out. I'm a manager with um, private clients and family wealth units of Anderson Tax. In this session, we'll be discussing the topic tactical and strategic portfolio reallocation. So where that is thumb. When we say the storm, we, we all know that um, we mean the current global economic slowdown occasioned by the coronavirus pandemic. COVID-19 was first identified in, okay. China in December 2019 and has spread to almost all the parts of the world. Most of the world economy and financial markets has been affected by the lockdown and social distancing measures put in place by government to reduce the spread of the COVID-19. The first case of COVID-19 was identified in Nigeria on the 27th of February, 2020. And since then, the uncertainty and general decline in global economic activities, as well as the sharp drop in the price of crude oil, have further reduced Nigeria's prospects of reversing the downward trend in portfolio investment. There are predictions of further decline in Nigeria's portfolio investment from several commentators and stakeholders, in, including the International Monetary Fund. In this session, our discussion will be focused on clients' concerns around portfolio rebalancing, around diversification, and around redeployment, uh, redeployment strategy in the short to mid-term period. To discuss these concerns and prefer workable solutions, we have a panel of seasoned professionals in portfolio investment management. I'll start by introducing uh, Mr. Samuel Enuich. En oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Samuel Enuich Yusui is the head of investment management at Investment One. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Illinois. He also holds an associate professional qualification of both the Institute of Chartered um, Accountants of Nigeria and the Chartered Institute of Stockbrokers. He has more than 20 years working experience in Nigeria's financial sector. Today, we'll be discussing invest investors' um, perception and reactions to the economic slowdown and portfolio structure, the technical analysis around timing of rebalancing. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Samuel. Thank you so much for having me. I, I do expect that we'll have a very- I knew it was. I apologize question. once more for that, yes. Thank no, you. you 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 did very well in the uh, pronunciation of the name. I'll give you five. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the scorecard. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Samuel. So we also have Mrs. Titi Odunfa Adeoye. She is the founder and chief investment officer of Sankore Investments. Titi's area of expertise is strategies for the creation, growth, and um, preservation of individual or family wealth with a focus on alternative asset classes like the venture capital, the real estate business, and agriculture due to the higher potential for financial and social returns. She's an active investor across various sectors, particularly those that impact wealth building in Africa. Titi holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, a bachelor's degree in accounting from Howard University, and she is a certified public accountant. Titi, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, also included on our panel is Ms. Dalanri Fabumi. He's currently the Managing Director, Aiko Capital Limited. Aiko Capital Limited is an investment management firm in Nigeria. Larry Fabomi also has a well-detailed and diverse experience in financial services covering banking, risk management, corporate restructuring, corporate finance and advisory services, amongst others. Larry started his career as a trainee in FCMB. He has also worked as a senior consultant and analyst with KPMG and ARM investment managers, respectively. Larry holds a master's of business administration from the University of Chicago. He is also a qualified member of ICANN, Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. Thank you so much, Mr. Fabumi, for joining us this morning. Thanks for me, and thank you to Business Day for organizing this very apt, you know, discussion, and, and uh, look forward to a good uh, debate. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So for our audience who have questions on um, this subject matter, please visit www.slido.com to drop your questions, and please remember to specify the panelists you wish to address your questions. So we'll just um, go straight to the questions, and... Um, I'd like to 
um, ask Mr. Samuel a few questions. So generally, what are, your, what are the impacts of the current economic realities on portfolio investment in Nigeria? Okay, so when we talk about the reality, just as you did mention in the introduction, it has to do with the impact of COVID. COVID has affected economic activi I mean, activities globally due to um, the occasion to lockdown that was introduced as a way of managing um, the virus. So the lockdown had affected um, economic activities, so production had declined, demand for oil and other um, energy-related uh, products and services have declined, and that has also affected the prices of, of assets generally. If, if you look at it, um, the price of crude oil, which is the mainstay of our economy, um, declined about 66% from the beginning of the year uh, to state about 22.7 as that much and that was a massive uh, um, uh, decline so the pandemic generally basically assets on a negative basis so globe so uh, also note that the prices of equities declined um, locally the prices of equities declined and the yield in the fixed income space is also not um, escape the effect of coronavirus. We saw yields going at all time high, particularly for the Nigerian sovereigns. Yields went to as high as 13, 14%. And the same thing happened um, globally. So in one word, the, the effect of the pandemic on all asset classes have been significantly negative. Wow. Yeah, so um, if for the benefit of the audience that may not exactly know what um, portfolio diversification and rebalancing is, what in, in, in a nutshell, what can you just uh, enlighten them? What can you tell them about portfolio diversification and rebalancing? That's also to Mr. Samuel, before I go to the next panelist, please. So when we um, talk about portfolio, we look at, say, you know, growing up, we used to see our fathers have this portfolio and they keep several documents in there. So you can still, you know, look at it from that perspective. You have a sort of suitcase or a basket, and then you have many items that are valuable to you in that portfolio. So in this specific case, we're looking at a basket, virtual basket or a virtual suitcase where you keep your assets. So the assets now could be equities, Equities basically will refer to um, shares of fundamentally um, com fundamentally sound companies that you have acquired. It could also be fixed income, and that, that would do with the purchase of, say, treasury bills, um, um, government issued bonds, or corporate bonds. So, fixed income basically will refer to those instruments that pay periodic interest and then guarantees your return. You could also have some other um, alternative um, assets like say you invest in gold and then you also have cash. So when you put all of this together, it gives you what you call a portfolio of assets. So if time still permits, I quickly run through to say that when you are building this portfolio, a number of factors are taken into consideration. You want to look at um, the risk profile of the client, in terms of his attitude to risk, you want to look at his age. Now the age also affects his perception to risk. You want to look at his time horizon. Why is he building this portfolio? What are the goals he needs to achieve or the goals he wants to achieve? That is taken into consideration. Does he have any preference for um, periodic cash withdrawal from the investment either to meet some expenses that is looking to, that is also looking to other eth ethical consideration or other consideration that the clients may have also looked into in, as also looked into to build the portfolio. So in summary, when those factors are put into the model, you now have what is called an asset allocation. So for instance, we might say okay, we have 70% of this portfolio will have assets allocated to fixed income and then maybe 30% to equities and cash. So when the value fluctuates because of the ups and downs in the market, and then you go outside this asset allocation, 
that now calls for a need to rebalance the portfolio so that you, the portfolio will fall in line with the initial setting. So that's all about um, portfolio creation, diversification, and then rebalancing. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Mr. Samuel, for that um, insightful um, approach to the question and then the answers were very insightful. So I'll go to um, Ms. Titi Adioye. Okay, so my question is, how can investors, because um, Sankore Investments is a well-known investment company and you've done a lot, yes, we've gone through your profile also. So how can investors maximize their returns on investment through portfolio diversification within the current economic realities? So, Ms. Adoye. Apologies, sorry, I was on mute. Um, I think at least the core of the question is just sort of navigating this time, right? And I think um, one of the things that we've spoken to clients about is that this is actually a good time to really take a, a proper look at one's portfolio. Um, again, I think the majority of people actually do not hold a diversified portfolio um, because there are not that many people who actually work with professionals. So at the end of the day, you just buy what you like. Um, it's actually at times like this, uh, given you know just sort of the recent pandemic and so on and so forth, it's times like this that people actually listen more to what they should be doing from a theoretic perspective because um, you know probably because they've already lost a lot of money. Um, so what we recommend at this time is to take time to think, you know, in other words, don't, what we see a lot of people do is saying, okay, what do I need to be buying now? Do I need to uh, buy Angola and Euro bonds? Do I need to, what they're trying to do is to make up for the money they have lost, which is not the right way to approach uh, your long-term portfolio. Um, so really, it's about being long term with regards to the way you think about your investments, right? So the first thing we tell people to do is just stop, just stop rushing, looking for the best deal during the pandemic, right? You've probably already lost quite a bit of money. This is a time for you to actually just sit still and have and, and just be a little bit educated about what you need to make your portfolio portfolio whether the next downturn, which there will be. Again, um, the only thing that is certain about markets is that there will be up, ups and downs, right? So we say to people, um, this is a good time for you now to really take a look at your portfolio. Um, think about your long-term views uh, about the markets. If you don't have clear views um, and you, you're not necessarily someone that can educate yourself to the level that is needed to make the right decisions, um, engage an advisor and work yeah. together with the advisor to craft a long-term investment strategy for yourself. So that's the first thing is during this time, don't just immediately uh, be rushing around trying to fix what has already been broken. The best thing is for you to actually think to yourself, okay, what kind of portfolio do I need to put in place for the next pandemic? Um, and that's where portfolio diversification comes in, right? So again, it's, yeah. it's often just thought of as a buzzword. It's something people know they're supposed to do, but no one ever really understands why. Well, this is the time where people understand much more viscerally why diversification is important, or at least they're a lot more open to hearing about it, right? So it's again back to what Samuel was talking about earlier is the objective of now, the objective of portfolio diversification is for you to create a portfolio, which may not be a portfolio that does 100% every year, but your portfolio is weather, is structured to weather large drawdowns. So drawdowns are when you see a big drop in the market like we saw this year, right? So if, for example, you are one of those people who um, last year just thought to yourself, oh, well, let me put all my eggs in this certain basket because it looks interesting. I mean, take, for example, a bunch of people who are rushing into cryptos at the beginning of the year. Um, some people were putting all their eggs in the S&P 500 basket. Um, the key point at the end of the day is just going that um, approach where you're not spread across uh, different asset classes can lose you money. 
over the long term. And, and I think the key point to remember when you're thinking about why diversification is, is important is just remember one thing, if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, is that remember the, the, the phrase asymmetry of returns. What that means is um, returns work differently on the downside than they do on the upside. Oh. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so the point being, if I have a hundred million Naira now and I lose 50% of my portfolio, I'm going to go down to 50 million. But for me to go back from 50 million to 100, I have to grow 100%. So remember, I lost 50%, but it takes me 100% growth to come back. Now, the objective of a diverse portfolio is that you're trying your best to avoid drawdowns as much as possible. So when you go full whole hog into one asset class, it is much more likely that you will have um, a portfolio that swings up and down in a very drastic um, manner. Um, so the whole point is at this time, this is time for you to stop and think and buy into the theory of diversification. I think that's the first point because most people don't really, it's just sort of something they hear and think about every drawdown, but commit mm -hmm. to the theory of diversification and create a portfolio that will weather the storm over the long term, pandemics happen every 30 years. Um, the business cycle is five to seven years. There will always be a downturn. And setting up a, a portfolio that can weather any up and down is really the objective, or at least should be a, the objective of any investor. Now to answer the question about what to do now, right? Um, given what's going on now, um, we have a three-pronged strategy we're speaking to clients about. And the first objective is what I said, which is just stop think about, about diversification and actually implement a diverse portfolio first. Yeah. But let's talk about specifically how to do that, right? So because at the end of the day, you probably already invested in many different things. We're saying, yes, just take, take your losses if necessary. Most people don't like taking losses. They're hopeful that things will get better, but take your losses and then put your eggs in the right baskets, right? But as you're doing that, we're recommending that you diversify into liquidity. So this is not really the time for you to be taking lots of risk, especially you coming out of um, potential losses. Um, diverse, diversify into liquidity. So what that means is if you're gonna go into USD, now, now this is a good time for you to be thinking of your currency allocation. Are you holding enough USD given your spending pattern? Do you have USD expenses? And if that is the case, you should be holding some in USD. Are you holding enough um, different countries? Um, but then diversify into liquidity, which means um, go into just sort of the less lower risk um, um, lower risk areas for now. Um, again, even some of those areas are, you know, are actually um, offering interesting returns. So, for example, if you're okay. putting money into euro bonds, um, you can actually invest in bonds that can return 15% per annum, which is actually very high already. So, um, within your USD allocation rushing into the highly risky asset classes is probably not the right thing to do right now. We're still saying that, especially for the, the, for the average individual investor, it makes sense to be a bit watchful and careful yeah. until it is clear just sort of what's going on with the economy and uh, where this macro story is gonna lead us. Then finally, you now start positioning to leg in into cheap assets. And so there are quite a lot of cheap assets, which we can talk about later in the presentation. Yeah. Um, but what we're saying is that you should be going in little by little rather than just jumping all in. So the overall summary of what I'm trying to say is this is time for you to just be very measured in your approach and very thoughtful. And don't focus on now so much. Focus on the next 10 to 20 years of your portfolio. Um, and that's what portfolio diversification will help you do. Honestly, um, I actually picked so many things from what you said. I know um, this part of the world, we always go for things that are trending. So you hear the crypto is, um, is on now, everybody runs into it and the next thing you're running out. So if I want to ask in a nutshell, what is the ideal investment strategy for this uncertain time? What should I 
just invest in? How should I go about it? And what exactly would you call ideal for this uncertain time? Um, so we actually have um, a recommended portfolio for our clients. Um, interestingly enough, we've actually, as I said, what, what we tend to see is that during these times, uh, for those who have lost a lot of money, they actually decide to act in a more risk-loving manner in an effort to recover the money, right? So yeah. as I said, you know, you'll hear people asking about all sorts of things, but the key is a diverse portfolio is what makes sense. And then I can just talk to you briefly through what um, our optimal portfolio looks like for the average high net worth individual um, that is based in Nigeria, but likely has exposure to global expenses. Um, we think that you should, at least for a moderate risk investor, you should still be thinking of um, holding majority of your portfolio in fixed income. Um, if you remember from the first session, quite a lot of people talked about the fact that the asset allocation of Nigerians is very different from um, the global asset allocation, which is just a reflection of our own culture, our own specific uh, realities, um, and our own preferences. Um, most high net worth individuals in Nigeria are highly um, over allocated to real estate. So what you actually find is, um, and I, I think it was Martin who mentioned that most HNIs are illiquid in Nigeria. That actually does tend to be true. So what you find is majority of them, um, just over 10 years of um, global, us, us doing portfolio analysis for clients, we found that um, 40, about high 40s to 60% of their net worth um, tends to be held in real assets like real estate. Um, now I'm excluding their primary asset, which for most high net worth individuals tends to be their businesses, um, but they tend to hold quite a lot in real estate um, and very little actually in fixed income, which is um, another thing to remember is fixed income is your sleep well money. Right, so it's the money that can help you weather a pandemic, right? So we are highly, at least the average high net worth individual is highly under allocated to fixed income. Um, so really when we work with clients around trying to get their portfolios um, aligned, one of the first things we recommend to them is to sell real estate and buy fixed income. And if you know Nigerians, that's something that it just tears against their natural feelings of just sort of where their money should be. And we really are strong believers that real estate is a, is a preserver of long-term value. Um, it infl it's an inflation hedge. We've heard all these things that are mostly um, from the West. Um, please be aware that these things are not true in Nigeria, at least not completely true. Um, most of the real estate held by high net worth individuals in Nigeria um, is residential real estate. And residential real estate is not at all an inflation hedge in Nigeria. It's maybe a partial hedge. And the reason why is because it's very difficult for you actually to raise rents in Nigeria. We all know that. It's very difficult for you half the time to collect rents even. So it does not function as an inflation hedge in the portfolio. So the first uh, feedback that we give to clients is, look, real estate in your portfolio being such a large part of your allocation is a mistake, which this is a good time for you to start correcting. Yes, it's not the best time to sell real estate. Yeah. Yes, uh, but remember, real estate lags the cycle. You're not gonna see price recoveries for at least another year or two. There's no point you waiting to catch up. In reality, what we find is the majority of people who take their losses now and then reinvest actually do better than those who are sitting waiting for the prices of real estate to come back. So if, for example, you were to sell down your real estate, let's say you have a, a house in Ikoi that's that you believe is worth 300 million Naira, but really the best you can get for it is 200, it's a lot better for you to actually take the 200, um, put it into um, an instrument. Uh, let's say, for, for example, you're under allocated to USD. Uh, this would have been a good time for you to um, um, turn, uh, put that money into, let's say, something like uh, euro bonds. Again, that's a tricky thing to do now just because your the uh, currency exchange now is, of course, very difficult. But we're talking to clients about making sure that they're thinking of these allocations properly. So as I said, the first thing you should be doing is thinking about how to get out of your real estate allocation. 
it's at least a good time to commit to doing so, even if it takes you a year or two to get out completely. Um, and then to think about upping your fixed income allocation, we recommend 47%. And we recommend oh, yes. that you put that between um, Nigerian fixed income and uh, uh, developed market as well as emerging market fixed income. So yeah. developed market fixed income yeah. primarily priced in USD and emerging market uh, fixed income, but primarily also the sovereigns of those emerging markets. Um, there's actually an index that tracks that, and there are ways to get that exposure. Um, equities are a space where we re we recommend for clients to have some exposure, but um, our recommendation is for you to not hold more than 17% of your um, allocation to equities. Now, remember, from a global perspective, you're going to hear people outside the country telling you to put 50% of your, of your net worth in equities. That's actually the typical global allocation. But that's actually based on um, offshore-based clients um, who are investing in USD equities and don't necessarily have access to you know, some of the level of fixed income that we have, fixed income returns that we have, as well as some of the other asset classes that we have. Um, so an optimizer does not actually allocate majority of your um, assets to uh, offshore equities. That's not correct. It's actually, we would actually recommend consider putting about 10% of your assets in um, developed market equity. The reason why is our fixed income actually performs much better than um, a lot of global clients. So global clients are looking at fixed income returns of 2%, 1%. So that's why it makes a lot more sense for them to be in equity. Yeah. Our fixed income returns yeah. are a bit better here, but um, also there are actually other opportunities, especially on the alternative space. And I think Toya mentioned that earlier. Um, I would like to address one thing before I stop talking. Okay, uh, <laughs> um, so, so one of, sorry, just one more thing. One of the okay. key things that we want to dissuade people from doing is this concept of running putting all your money in USD. It is true that USD does you know, protect you, but in reality, um, there is a level at which holding Naira does make sense. And we think that level is around 20% of Naira returns. Um, and there are actually opportunities in the, in the alternative space that make a lot of sense to do that. So <laughs> both in things... Sorry, let me stop. No, Sorry. it's okay. Uh, honestly, you could go on and on, and I understand the passion that you have. Let me actually stop. Yeah, I understand the passion that you have. And we're, we're, I'm actually still coming back for more questions from you. And afterwards, I mean, so um, for Mr. Larry Fabumi, I would um, like to ask some questions. What are the asset allocation strategies and what is our eco capital currently doing to ensure that their investors take advantage of the current pandemic? So, Mr. Fabumi. All right. Thanks for me. Uh, thanks, Thank TTF. You. Uh, thank you, Samuel. Thank you for taking your time. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> oh, no. It's nice. a passion, I know. <laughs> well, thanks. I think, you know, so for us, I mean, broadly speaking, right, uh, asset allocation is really, from an investor point of view, a question of risk and return, you know, so you want to get the best risk, so the best return for level of risk you're you're, you're willing to take, you know. Um, so and, and and that's it really. So whatever age you are, whatever target you have, it's really a function of you know, how do I get the best return for level of risk I'm willing to take. Yeah. I think probably thinking that's it. In terms of how we think about it, you know, uh, so we we currently manage about you know one might million of. Uh, 13,000 clients. Uh, so we have, you know, a, a bit of retail clients, but a large portion of our AUM actually, you know, it, it, yeah. it's corporate clients. Uh, so the way we approach this with most of the clients is really to, you know, try and look at, you know, what, what are the objectives, you know, um, clients have different objectives, right? What are the constraints you have, you know, so for most clients, we consider duration, how long are you willing to invest for? Because yes, you can see, let's take a long-term view, but there are clients that you know just have a, a one-year investment horizon, a five-year investment horizon, a 10-year investment horizon. So obviously what duration or horizon the client is willing to invest for, you know, determines what sort of assets, you know, you want to sort of 
they push or, or allocate to the clients. I would consider risk as well. What level of risk are you willing to take? Um, some clients are quite, you know, risk averse, in which case you've got to be careful as to, you know, the volatility of the asset you're recommending for the client to put in a portfolio. Look at compliance as well. You know, some clients have compliance requirements. Uh, we have quite a number of clients who are financial institutions and therefore have potential guidelines that, you know, restrict or, you know, guide what we can put their money in and liquidity. Liquidity requirements, you know, so how liquid do you want a portfolio? Do you want to be able to liquidate? How easy is it to liquidate, you know, the entire portfolio without a significant of material loss in value? Those are the key things we look at in recommending assets, you know, to clients. And then the kind of assets we recommend, broadly speaking, you know, bonds, treasury bills, equities, alternative assets. That, that's it really. Um, however, in Nigeria, I think, you know, I, I, I was quite happy when TT, you know, did mention that, you know, Nigeria is a different environment, you know. So our study in Nigeria shows that, so globally you find that, you know, they tell you, do a, if you are young, do a 60-40. So 60% equities and 40% in fixed income because, you know, globally, you typically find that equity markets outperform fixed income market. In Nigeria, we found that that's not the case. So we have some, we've done a bit of study around asset classes in Nigeria. So, you, you know, we've looked at, you know, treasury bills. So if you just invest in treasury bills and all over every, at every maturity, um, look at fixed income, which is government bonds, now risk-free now, so not even corporate bonds, but risk-free instruments. Uh, so government bonds, five-year bonds, 10-year government bonds, 20-year government bonds. Uh, look at public equities, so the NSCASI, and looked at commodities. Uh, there are other asset classes like infrastructure and alternative assets like private equity venture capital. That is difficult to put a number to, you know, because you don't have publicly available data to, to, to you know, give a sense of what the sector has done. What we've found is that, you know, if you look at a five-year view, um, you know, so I'm gonna walk you through the, the, the data. So five years, the best performing assets has been treasury bills in Nigeria. So treasury bills in five years has given you total return of about 111%, so 111%. So you basically have doubled your money in five years. Basically buying treasury bills when they mature rollover. This is passive. You don't have to do anything. Buy government treasury bills, they mature rollover. Um, in 10 years, it's giving you 328%. That's more than three times your money in just buying treasury bills. That's the highest return. If you compare that to public equity, which is the NSC ASI index in Nigeria, in five years, you would have lost 12%. Risk free instruments, you are making double your money in five years. NSC ASI, you've lost 12%. In 10 years, you've made a gain, but a gain of 23% investing in equities versus three times your money if you were to invest in just treasury bills. You know, uh, so that's treasury bills versus equities. Commodities is neither here nor there. Commodities in five years have lost for three percent. In ten years, we've lost eighteen percent. That's basically looking at brand crude, by the way. Uh, if you look at so the, the best performing instrument or investment assets for a passive investor, you know, this is without considering the the skill of the asset manager, is been treasury bills in Nigeria. You know, um, in for bonds, bonds come to a, come come a close second. Uh, the five-year bonds in ten years give me six percent, and five years on six percent. Ten-year bonds eighty-two percent in ten years. Uh, five years now it's four percent. You said the bonds. The longer you go with the bond, is the with fixed income instruments, share the long duration one, the five, ten-year, twenty-year bonds. There is the coupon you earn when you hold it, but there's also the capital appreciation or depreciation when you do a mark to market. You know so. Our, our investment thesis as a firm, our investment ethos has actually been fixed income. So of the about 185 billion we manage, um, close to 175 billion of that, actually it's in fixed income and fixed income basically being treasury bills and, and government instruments. Um, and this and this are returns and it, 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 it's scientific. There's no point in trying to mirror America to Nigeria. So our advice to clients has been the last, you know, five years or six years of the company is pure fixed income, you know, uh, okay. go fixed income in Nigeria because okay. that's, so that, that's one. Second benefit apart from the return is the liquidity. So fixed income, I mean, the market is quite, quite liquid. So it's the main players in the market are the, the bank, commercial banks, what they call the PDMMs, uh, the pension funds and the asset managers. That 
industry or that market does in a month about three, four trillion in turnover. So if you want to sell the entire portfolio, to 125, if we sell the entire portfolio today, we have 1.5 billion, we can sell the entire portfolio in two days without a significant loss in market value. The thought, the thought, so I mean it's 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 risk risk. The thought point really there is the, the rating. I mean, these are you know government, there's never really never been a time in the history of the world about one where government has defaulted on its local currency obligations. You know, so we know that you buy a government bond or treasury bill, apart from the returns you're getting, there will be no default. I mean, the government can increase taxes to get more money, or they can just print money. There's inflation, but I mean your return is is, is a short. The last point. There is the, you know, uh, the tax advantage. You know, so equities you sell you even when you earn three percent in ten years, government takes ten percent as capital gains tax. With the government bonds, it's risk free. You know, so yeah, basically the, the money goes cash into your pocket without any you know tax obligation. So for us, that's how we think about our location, uh, and then basically what we recommend to clients. <laughs> you, you know, I, I like I actually love the last point, and that's actually going to um, take me to another question. But before then, I just want to uh, read out the Slido code, which is Ash P B W M S. So if you have questions, please just specify the panelist you want to address your question. And I have a lot of questions in the chat um, room already, but. I just want to ask a question concerning the top points that you raised. So from a tax perspective, I am I'm aware that um, those, those kind of assets are not liable to taxes, but how can investors enjoy the tax benefit from reallocating their portfolios? How do you think they can enjoy those benefits when they reallocate the portfolios that they currently hold? Okay, I think, you know, thanks for me for the question. Well, so I'll start with the first. So, I mean, before, from a reallocation point of view, if you've made losses, you've made losses. You know, I mean, there's what they call an investing tax loss investing. So what that means is that, you know, you can, you know, if you know that you've, well, the government looks at you know, your taxes from a total totality point of view. So if you know that, if you have an asset that you've made a loss on, you know, um, there's no point in holding it. It's just, you know, uh, book your losses. Um, the beauty with booking your losses on that asset is that because, and investing in risk-free, for instance, is that you can book your losses. So as you have a 10% loss on a, an equity investment, you book the loss, um, because you've realized the loss, that you have a tax, you have like a, a tax claim with, with the government of about 10% yeah. of that. So even if you do have a gain on other things you've invested in, that loss you booked, you know, helps helps with that. The second point is, you know, like we said, these returns you see in risk-free instruments are returns that go straight to your pocket without any government, both state and local government, well, state and federal governments don't, you know, charge your taxes on on risk on well corporate bonds and, and, and treasury bills as well, fixed income instruments generally. Um, so I mean, I think that basically ensures that you know your your as against a, a, a placement with a bank, you go and do. It if for example, with a bank, for instance, even if you get three or four, whatever you get, there's a tax, tax, tax uh, liability that you have to you have to face. You know, so I mean, it's 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 uh, that, that that's our view, and and that that's been what we've recommended to clients for the last uh, five years or so. Thank you, Larry, for the question, uh, for answering that question. Um, so I'm going to the chat room now. I have a question that says, when talking about diversification, do we have ETF, which I presume is the exchange traded funds in Nigeria, which are spread across the top Nigerian companies. So I will direct the question to Mr. Samuel. Do you need me to read the question again? No, I, I did hear you um, loud and clear. Okay, okay, so for ETFs, we do have ETFs, um, a couple of them um, listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. So ETF basically um, is a construction of uh, portfolios with well-defined objectives um, across various um, um, sectors within the equity space so that clients could enjoy the benefit of um, a well-improved uh, returns. Okay, yeah. so that's that for it here. But if you do permit me to um, go a little bit further, I would like to address the issue of 
um, diversification. I, I, I take it from where Larry stops. I mean, I like the, the analysis that he has given us with the um, figures, but that presupposes a passive investment strategy. And he actually alluded to that, a passive investment strategy. When we discuss with our clients, particularly at investment one, we do a combination of passive and active investment strategies because the clients do not have a good knowledge and experience and exposure to the various financial securities locally and um, internationally. And that is why they are willing to pay you some fees so that you could, you could construct your portfolio, manage it for good returns. So now, when you talk about losses on your portfolio, did they hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, the definition of that is what we call mark to market losses. So it's not that you have sold the asset to realize the loss. It is that when that asset in its current market price is compared with the price at which you acquired it, it's negative. Now, we don't just advise booking losses, straightforward. We, we look at what has occasioned the decline in that asset class. Let's go back to the current coronavirus pandemic, which is a big systemic risk to investing globally. Our understanding shows that for all asset classes in Nigeria, we face one systemic risk, and that is the um, mono revenue base of the Nigerian economy. By that, I mean over 90% of our revenue as a nation is from one product, in this case, crude oil. Yeah. Now, whatever happens, all asset classes in Nigeria, T-bills, government bonds, corporate bonds, equities, it will affect all asset classes in Nigeria. Because I'm also conscious of time, I won't go into the statistics, say in the last say five to 10 years, because just one, um, one, one, one information will be good for us. In 2016, the yield on T-bills was about 20, 21%. But currently in the Nigerian treasury bills bills, it's about 4%. So that's just to tell you that when you have serious decline in price of oil, it affects even the, fixed, the value and the returns of the fixed income instrument. So what I was trying to say is, a critical understanding of the reason why that asset class has declined is key to know how the rebalancing of the portfolio will be done, whether you want to take loss or whether you want to um, buy the asset that has diminished in value yeah. or what. Now, the coronavirus situation, so because the economic activity globally came down and then the prices of oil came crashing, like I told you earlier on, it lost about 66% between year end and March. It was so obvious that the world was going to respond. Mm. And in trying to respond, the OPEC and its allies called OPEC Plus made a little bit of a blunder and that caused a Saudi Arabia and um, Russia price war, and that led yeah. to price to further decline. But when they got it right in April with the intervention of US and they struck that very um, historical deal to cut over 9.7 million barrels of, 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 of crude oil from, from the world's production, prices rebound. So what I'm trying to say is this. So we know that the effect on oil is gonna be short-lived. 
with, it, it's so obvious because of the effect on the world economy, because there will be so many companies that will go into bankruptcy in US, in Europe, in Nigeria, if that is not stopped. And that will cause a um, um, decline in, in the value of, of, of global currencies that will cause decline in purchasing power that will cause unemployment. You can name what the social effect will be. So we knew and we expected that there was going to be, you know, a sort of stabilization in that. We had a particular client that had good investment with us in the USD space and euro bonds, and it was cared. But we did give him the assurance when we had a conference call concerning our understanding and our outlook. And you will recall that say March, or should I say April, when that you know historical agreement was reached, between then and say May, the price of oil went back 60% from 22 to about 35. Yeah. We also saw the same recovery in the price of equities. If you look at the US that, for instance, between March and May was about 35% up. In our own local equity space, using the all share index was about 5%. But if you drill down to few names which we which we only invest in at investment one, we're looking at say the fundamentalist stocks, they did about 45 to 50%. Now that's a good recovery. So when you talk about, you know, the losses in your portfolio, you need a good understanding before you take an action. So that understanding will help you to know how the rebalancing will be done. So for me, a, a, a key strategy for the rebalancing of your portfolio will be the understanding of the economic realities, factors that are interplaying globally and locally. And that is you know, what we speak to our clients to be able to give them the comfort, the assurances that they need, and then such actions are taken. So I'll just Thank leave it you. at that. <laughs> Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. So I'll just read this other question um, from the chat room and it's um, directed at um, TT. Thank you for the discussion. We all appreciate it. Quick question, TT. Um, TT had mentioned at least holding 20% of one's portfolio in Naira and investing and investing in alternative investment with 20% return. Now for Nigeria, no investment product will offer a net positive investment currently with inflation at 12.14% and interest income on fixed income um, products around five to 6%. So what kind of investments um, in Naira um, I, is she exactly discussing? Again, one has to remember most Nigerians are risk averse and ours is about principal preservation. So what products will match that risk profile? What are the underlying assets to that? So the question is directed at Titi. Okay, um, I think first of all, I wanted to correct that. I didn't say 20% in Naira. We actually recommend for high net worth individuals who have dollar exposure to, to have more than 50% of their portfolio in Naira. Um, and even some of the stuff that is in dollars is even in Naira denominated Euro bonds. So I, I wanna make that clear because we're not advocates of uh, taking our capital out of the country. Um, so I think it gets back to the point I was trying to make is that one of the key things that we do at Sankari that we're very passionate about is unearthing returns in Naira that could make it, that would make it um, interesting for investors to keep their money in Naira, even at the allocation that we're recommending. And as I said, um, if you look at the history of depreciation, you need to be looking of returns north of 20 to make you indifferent between holding Naira and dollars, right? Um, so because of that, we definitely look a lot in the alternative space because that's really the only way you can do that. It's not gonna be in equities. Larry already told you the numbers. It's not gonna, fixed income also would give you relatively good return, but it's not going to be the 20% numbers. Of course, we saw a couple of years where you could do that in T-bills, but sorry, I think I saw another, another question asking about T-bills. That's not coming back anytime soon. So let's take our face, faces off of that. The key thing though, is we really believe that the key to unlocking um, high returns 
is uh, the alternatives market. And when I say alternatives, I mean real estate, agriculture. I mentioned it in my profile that just sort of some of the things that we're very interested in looking at. And we have been doing this for several years. Um, Sanctuary is only about 10 years, 10 years old, but during that time period, we spent nine years also focusing quite a bit on real estate. Um, and then additionally, we, um, We've spent another six years or so also focusing very strongly on agriculture. Um, and so uh, let's not all forget that um, there's individual wealth, but then there's also aggregate wealth of the nation. If we are all carting our money out to put in USD products abroad, guess what? We will all actually continue to make ourselves poorer. Um, so for us, it's actually important for our clients to get their own individual returns higher, but it's also important from the long term for us all to realize that this is what is best for our country. So um, given that, and to answer the question, given that real estate actually has the potential to, to do that for you. Um, and I'll talk about the other as well, but real estate, the problem, the reason people don't make money in real estate is that they buy the wrong things. So rental yields right now in real estate, uh, it, it's not very high. It's between 3 and 5% across um, residential. So the average Nigerian investor holds residential. The average Nigerian high net worth individual is highly over allocated to uh, areas like Ikoi, Leki, uh, Maitama, all these places that really that's not where you make money in real estate. The problem, though, is the average HNI doesn't want to go build flats in Ikorodu, which is where the need is. Rich people do not need any additional flats in Ikoi, but there is actually still a housing gap in this country, and it's really more at the lower to mid end. So one asset class that we've been talking about for the last two to three years, sub asset class of real estate is student housing. There's a strong need for student housing in this country, and it hasn't been filled by developers because investors are not funding them, right? So student housing um, can actually give you yields north of 15%, potentially north of 20%, really depending on how much of the return the developer lets you have, right? But um, we're already currently working on some products for clients that would give them exposure to 15 to 20% returns, um, knowing that because now yields are so low, you know, there's no need to offer yields that are as high as 20 and 25, you know, so you'll end up seeing that yields will drop a bit now just because yeah. of, the, of the return potential. But um, student housing is one to take a good look at. Um, let's not, there's also, um, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar okay. with Chapel Hill. As a, sorry, one quick thing. Chapel okay. Hill actually has a debt fund called the Nigerian Debt Fund. Now, again, I'm a big collaborator. I love when my competitors do great things, and I point that out as well. They have a great a fund that invests in real estate that has done 19% over the last year. Um, we have to invest in our country, right? And real estate is a very good way to do that. Agriculture as well. Um, we have a platform called Wealth.ng where we list agriculture op opportunities. We've listed uh, agri-finance to rice and a bunch of other places for as high as 18% over the last year or so. Um, of course, the rates are much lower now, but that's another space to keep an eye on. Apex, the commodity exchange, actually offers you opportunities to do that. Yeah, I, I apologize that I, I tried to interject here, but no problem, no problem. similar question on real estate. I know I go on <laughs> no, it's okay. So this question is from Professor Sebastian um, Oremadu. He says, why divestment from real estate to Nigerian investors' portfolio construction when we lack enough houses? So I think you've been able to address that question in this um, answer that you just um, gave to us. But I don't know if you have more to tell him concerning real estate and... Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying is that we're yeah. building the wrong type of real estate. We're all focusing on building expensive stuff. So the vacancy rates in Equi, Equi has a vacancy rate of 22%. You yeah. all drive by Equi and see all these empty buildings, right, with their lights on and fancy looking, but there's no one living there, right? So yeah. it's a 22% vacancy rate. The vacancy rate in Yaba is less than 2%, right? So we're building the wrong thing. So we're not saying you shouldn't have real estate. We're just saying you need to rotate 
out of the type of things that you currently think are the only investment opportunities and, and start location. thinking about others like student housing, um, like even potentially working class housing. There are quite a lot of things and yeah. models that are coming up now. There are a few people looking at social living constructs, um, shared offices and so on. All these things are for the lower end of the market. And really that's where the return potential is. Um, but Thank you so much. Yeah. Fund managers to come in and you know make things easy for clients to be able to get into those products. All right. Thank you so much, Titi, for that. So I have a question from the Slido. Um, it says to Mr. Samuel, what should you consider when you decide to rebalance and diversify your portfolio with the knowledge that all the sectors are doing poorly? So, and I also have another question for Mr. Samuel. Maybe we should just take it together. How do you edge inflation against fixed income investment in a high inflation country like Nigeria? Okay, maybe we'll start with the second question. I, yes. I think, I think and then when you're is, done, I also want Mr. Fabumi to address the, the question. Another question here. Okay, I think TTD um alluded to that concerning inflation at the moment we don't have that is in nigeria we don't have specific um instruments that are inflation linked so um you need to turn to the alternative asset class to be able to um, get returns that will surpass the current inflation rate um, in current inflation rate that is what um, um the question speaks about when it says hedge against inflation. So you need to look into the alternative asset um, classes. Um, for us at Investment One, we have been having um, a great deal of discussion with um, um, the guys at Afex concerning investments in the agricultural space via the various products and with um, um, a very strong collaboration as well. So yes, agriculture will be it. Um, if you look at our GDP numbers, that's the greatest contributor to um, our GDP numbers and the yeah. government is also focused in that direction to be able to grow the economy. You want to recall that um, when the GDP numbers uh, was released by MBS for Q1 um, year on year compared to Q1 2018, um, we experienced a decline and um, it's projected that um, we might have a recession. So agriculture infrastructure um, um, just as some examples of the way to go to be able to increase the GDP and to be able to have a good return. So I agree with TT, um, we have uh, one or two infrastructural funds that are doing well. Um, we need to also invest in that. Um, in the area of real estate, um, it used to do that would be the, the rates, you know, as um, a number of them are also listed on the stock exchange. You could, you yeah. could, you know, consider um, all of those. So inflation is, so I will use inflation to link back to the first question. Now inflation is, it's, it's something that erodes the um, returns power that you have yeah. on, on your uh, portfolio. So having taken note of that, alternative. Okay, um, I guess so. Um, Another um, um, factor, fact would be when, um, sorry, can you hear me? Okay, I was just Hello? trying, I, I thought your internet was fluctuating, but I wanted to just, the um, questions sorry, of the time also. Trying, yes. The call was trying to come in. Okay. That that. All right, so I was trying to talk about what do you do when all your asset classes are performing poorly? At, that speaks to the first question. So like I said earlier on, a great deal would be your understanding of the factors that have caused mm -hmm. those assets to perform poorly. This agrees with your factors at the beginning of the construction of the portfolio. You know, you look at it that having mentioned all of those factors you, you, you consider in building a portfolio, the critical factor would be the fundamental factors the systemic risk as we see, a great deal of it will have to be the political risk. Now you look at it, so do you expect the, uh, um, the risk in the political space to decline? If your answer is no, 
What okay. are the assets you have taken because of that? I will round up now because okay. of time. Oh, yeah, because we, yeah. okay, so, so, we have just one minute. Because we have one minute to the so, end of the session. Mm -hmm. A summary approach to answering that question. Okay, so okay. quickly, when so the first thing would be the fundamental factors you consider building the, the, the portfolio this service the factors happening now that has caused the poor state of the assets. Then the second one would be, what is your outlook going forward? Putting all of this together, you'll be able to rebalance your portfolio, right. portfolio appropriately. That does not exclude the fact that if you need to take losses, that is book losses, you can. Okay. I'm, I'm actually sorry, I have to interject. If you need to inject more funds, you can, depending on your... Okay, Mr. Simon, I have to interject because we have less than one minute to go. And I know we have, I've been seeing a lot of questions and we'll actually make the panelists send the answers across to, to the audience. So um, for Mr. Fabumi, I just have one, um, one last question for you. Since we're almost running out of time, in 30 seconds, please, what is the main message that you like the audience to take away from this session? Well, I think it's really that, you know, there's no point in diversifying away from risk-free. Uh, the best in our experience, uh, the most profitable investment in Nigeria has been income instruments, tax-free, risk-free, very liquid. Uh, year to date, uh, the FMDQ index, which is the index of all bonds listed in FMDQ, is done total returns about 35%. That's 35% invested in a risk-free instrument. So, I mean, that's the capital gain and a coupon you get. So the, so the answer around what you did on inflation in our environment where yields are low. And when the yields are low, actually make more returns on the capital gains. Yeah. So our view is, you know, uh, Nigeria is a peculiar environment. Risk-free is where we think you should allocate your, most of your portfolio to yeah. and get the benefits from, you know, government revenues and, and also the taxes and liquidity. Thank, so that's you. Our view anyway. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. We, we've had an engaging and dynamic conversation that I believe is valuable for both the audience and the panelists themselves. So I know we can go on and on and um, time is actually against us on this segment of the webinar. We hope you found these tips useful for your um, future investments. And I would like to thank each participant or each panelist on this segment. I would like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Adoye, I would like to thank Mr. Samuel, and I would like to Thank Mr. Fabumi. And I'd also like to thank the organization Investment One um, um, and um, IECO Capital, and also want to thank CT for this um, insightful contributions on the segment. Thank you so much for the organizers of the event, Business Day, for a job well done. Thank you so much for Anderson Tax also. And um, thank you, everyone, for participating in this segment.
response during uncertainty and how advisors deliver. We would like to call and introduce the moderator for this panel, Esiri Agbeyi. Esiri Agbeyi is the partner at and head private wealth services at PwC Nigeria. She comes with um, extensive experience in wealth management and tax advisory, providing services to private and corporate clients. Esiri, welcome aboard and over to you. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Esiri Agbeyi. Thank you, Ronnie for the introductions and thank you to Business Day for organizing this event. Um, I have the pleasure of being, of moderating this session with distinguished um, panel of speakers and we've been assembled to discuss the three T's as Rolly had mentioned, um, which is around transparency, truth and trust, what clients want during these uncertain times and how advisors um, deliver. Um, before I give the um, the stage to my panelists to introduce themselves rather briefly. Um, we just wanted to touch base on the synopsis for this, why this topic. Um, truth, transparency, and trust um, underpin the relationship between advisors and clients. And we all know what's going on and how the rates have sunk or depressed um, rather significantly because of the pandemic and the commodity price weakening. Um, but this has ushered in a new normal, pivoted by revolutionary changes that will shock various industries. Um, however, advisors and teams who deal with very affluent individuals and families, whether as private bankers, trustees, wealth managers, tax consultants, or attorneys, have long prided themselves on the personal touch and close handling they share with their clients. But it's now a time of truth telling. You know, we must now embrace what has befallen us, but also tell the truth in this space. And to that extent, you know, there are questions around how clients can navigate their ripple effects of these situations on their portfolios. Um, and so this panel will focus on how firms are stepping up their relationship management practices and tools to meet the expectations of clients through the the economic slowdown. The interesting thing is we also do have with us a very distinguished investor, Paul Wanibe, who stands out amongst this pack and makes this pack also very unique. And he would also be sharing his views from the perspective of a client and investor. I'll start off with having Paul introduce himself briefly and then I'll go on to the other panelists. Paul? Thank you, Siri. Great to see you again, and thanks for having me on, the, on this um, platform. Um, yes, my name is Paul Wanibe. I'm the chief executive of the Landmark Group. Uh, we represent a sort of business, leisure, and lifestyle destination. Uh, obviously, we're, we're in very challenging times, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about that later. Thank you, Paul. Mr. Oyewale, can we just have your brief introductions, please? Thank you, um, Esiri. Um, my name is Tunde Iwale. I'm the managing partner of Olajide Iwale LLP. Um, OLLP is a member firm of Daily Piper Africa, which is um, part of one of the largest law firms in the world. Um, we serve mostly Nigerian corporate clients and um, business owners um, over the years. And I'm happy, thank, uh, grateful to Business Day for setting up this forum to discuss issues. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Oyewole. I'll the hand over to Mr. Thompson now. Yes, uh, good morning, Nasiri. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Idowu Thompson. I currently work as the group head for private banking at First Bank Nigeria, uh, which, as we all know, is one of the oldest and uh, most enduring banking institutions in Nigeria today. Um, I've roughly done over 20 years within the wealth management banking 
and financial services space. And four of those years have been with First Bank. Uh, prior to that, I worked with Standard Chartered Bank, where I was the head of the Africa Investment Advisory and Strategy Team, uh, which covered six countries, and um, also covered advisors and uh, relationship teams in those countries. Uh, my strong expertise is really in wealth management, where I've been exposed to that sector for a good portion of uh, my career. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to also being of value and also learning from this um, discourse today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ido Thompson. And last but not least, Mr. Taiwo Yusuf, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Taiwo Yusuf. Um, I work with Maristem Wealth Management Limited um, in asset management capacity. Uh, Maristem is a firm um, um, of, is a group of companies within the capital market. Uh, we serve clients um, across uh, um, different spectrum, we manage funds both in infrastructure, we manage funds on behalf of clients, um, HNIs, um, um, for, uh, institutional investors. And um, I, I'm glad to be here today to discuss um, uh, on this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Taiwo. Um, so I'll just start off with um, asking Ido a question and probably have um, inputs from also Mr. Oyewole and Mr. Yusuf as we go along. You know, how has the current crisis affected wealth management business in Nigeria? If you could just speak to how this has potentially affected your strategy, that would be helpful. Um, thank you very much, Asiri. Um, if I state very plainly, I think it's been one of the most uh, disruptive occurrences that we've had uh, since I've probably been alive. Uh, clearly, on a country level, we, and even on a global level, we've had disruptions to economic activity. We've had... Um, um, disruptions to the global supply chain. Um, we've had some concerns about country risk where clients would start asking questions as to whether or not their monies are safe in Nigeria. Uh, we've also had, in some cases, loss, loss of income and livelihood. And as you know, the business of wealth management for us is not just simply about helping people with their investments, but it's also about uh, wealth creation, the growth and preservation and transfer. So we're in a situation where we've had what has happened with uh, COVID-19, uh, with the impacts and the fall through on the economy, clearly it has impacted wealth creation. And it's also affected um, the way, not only with the, the way businesses are run, but also the pressures uh, in terms of uh, the revenue outcomes for any business. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yewali, do you want to add to that? Um, yes, I would say that um, from perspective of our clients, um, most of them have been very severely impacted by the uh, crisis and particularly a lot of them suffering from severe revenue shortfalls, which has meant that um, particularly for the leveraged businesses, um, they are struggling to meet um, loan commitments and pay their bills, so to speak. So that has led to a lot of searching and looking for strategies apart from trying to reduce costs, but also, for instance, having to sit down with bankers to renegotiate um, loan covenants um, either get suspension of interest uh, moratorium or reduction of interest uh, rates in several cases. So there has been a marked um, impact on the clients and a lot of clients are struggling because of this um, pandemic. 
it's interesting you raise that, Mr. Yewole, and I, I, I'd like to ask you another question, a follow-up question, but just after Mr. Yusu speaks, because I think what jumps out to me is just a very dear picture of what clients are facing, and um, I wish we had mentioned some of these as well in the previous session, but you did mention about restructuring of loan agreements and also the fact that costs now have to be revisited and probably restructured. And of course, all these are underpinned by agreements that um, also need to be looked at. So I think I would like your expertise as well in the next question that I've asked. But very briefly, Mr. Yusuf, could you just also speak to how you've seen the situation in the economy affect your business and your strategic approach to it? Yeah, thank you so much um, for all. Uh... I'm in the business of um, asset management, um, just like I said before, for um, HNIs and institutions. And um, for this period, like any period of uncertainty, um, cash is king. Um, for, so for most, for most people, it is more of um, trying to um, see okay, what, what is the best investment decision that what should be taken at this point in time. Um, especially when um, we are not so sure as to the direction of, of um, the performance of the different asset classes. So it's quite important. For, uh, so for most clients, um, the discussions that we've been having is more, okay, what should be the, um, what should be the direction of investment that we should be having? Um, and also if you put this in perspective as well for us as a nation, um, we are hugely dependent on oil and um, we will see the impact um, after the drop in the crude oil pricing below $20 and the impact it had on the foreign exchange in terms of the Naira exchange. So all these are things are what we, uh, we've been having discussion uh, with the different clients. And just like um, was also stated earlier on the loan restructuring for those that do as leverage, these are also part of the discussions um, that have come to the table as well. Thank you. Great, awesome. You know, the good thing is we also have Paul here. So maybe Paul, on reflection, you could also speak to some of the points noted here. But I want to ask you a specific question. You started Landmark Africa in 1997, and that business has gone through the dot-com bubble, September 11, um, the global and Nigerian banking crisis, and the recession in Nigeria for 2016. Now we're faced with another recession and that's like a double whammy with COVID-19. How different is it this time? Well, thank you, Siri. Um, um, very different um, and probably a lot more complex as, as, you, as you can imagine, we're certainly in the worst economic crisis of our generation. And so much has been said about the health crisis, um, but very little has been said about how we tackle the economic crisis. Um, I know, well, the dilemma we face today is that balance between the economy and the health. And there been some controversial tweets about how we all as the reactive disease. But as, as um, I think it's um, something that's uh, talked about sort of the black swan events that have happened. And in my mind, there's three that have happened literally at the same time. The pandemic is one, the lockdown is the second, and then the oil crisis is the third because it brings up uh, se several um, issues. So as you know, unexpected events lead to sort of extreme uncertainty, which leads to a lot of panic. At Landmark, um, we're a business leisure lifestyle developer, as you know. As you know. Um, our theme basically encourages people to come together. The current norm focuses today on social distancing, hence all our, our activities are closed. Our beach is closed, the cinema is closed, the event center is closed, the shops, the beverage outlets. Um, so as they say, there are no roses without thorns. Mm. <laughs> We represent the people suffering in the country. We're down zero here, and so, mm -hmm. so these are these are very tough times um, compared to some of the difficulties of the past. Mister mm. Yewale, would you say thanks, Paul? Mister Yewale, would you would you? I, I I guess you understand where Paul is also coming from. What would you have advised Paul in a scenario like this? I mean, there's panic. I'm sure, I don't know that you get the kind of questions he's also asking from your clients, but put yourself in his shoes and also give us a perspective on what your clients are also saying and how they're addressing it. 
Um, I think what Paul is experiencing is what um, the vast majority of business owners in Nigeria um, have experienced from either massive shortfalls and in some place cases, zero revenue for three months. Um, the problem that um, the clients face is how do you manage um, or cope with the prospect of having no revenues for three, four months and possibly even longer. And what um, in the early stages of the pandemic, what a lot of our clients did in that first month was to start scrambling for liquidity. And everybody ran around, go to the banks and try and either get new facilities or restructure existing facilities to give um, revenue, to give that liquidity so that if you don't have um, the revenue, you can still survive. And I think the key issue is being for the business to be in existence at the end of the pandemic. And that's what um, people are doing. In, in the UK, in the US, you had government support providing cheap loans to businesses to keep them in business so that they can continue to pay um, their workers and keep people off the unemployment rule. But here in Nigeria, there hasn't been that support for businesses. Um, the government doesn't have the resources and has, hasn't even thought about keeping businesses alive. So it's up to the business owners to struggle and think how they can keep their business alive um, even if it is in a state of uh, stasis until things get better and they, they can resume. But th that has been the primary focus of our clients in the last three months. Thanks, Mr. Oyewole. Do you think that this is just up to the business owners alone or there's something else they should be thinking about? Because I mean, I hear panic and in the midst of panic, there's probably a lack of, you know, comprehension on what exactly to do. So in the midst of that, what kind of solutions do you think clients should be exploring or, you know, your individuals should be exploring? Um, in, normal, in normal times, you would say if you cannot um, get um, resources from the banking sector, you go to look for equity investments, um, but right now, M&A is at a standstill. Um, most um, investors who have capital to invest are holding on to their liquidity. Nobody wants to invest. And the only people who are investing, they are doing it basically as vultures, um, scavengers, hoping to get um, cheap assets. So... Uh, I don't. I wouldn't advise any of my clients to actually sell at this time. Um, but rather, the advice I've given to the clients is: let's go to the banks, use relationships with the banks, and try and make sure you get some liquidity. Because they, they, most of the of these um, businesses and the owners, they have assets, so you can leverage those assets to raise funding. And that's what we've been doing with a lot of our clients. Thank you so much, Mr. Yewoli. And maybe I'll just go over to Idnu Fomsen now. Banking has probably been a highlight from some of the contributions from Mr. Yewoli and Paul. What, what, what do you think has been um, your response as a private banker in the midst of this situation? Well, well, th th thank you once again. I'd just like to um, maybe um, add to what uh, Mr. Yewole had said. Um, yes, there has been a government response to um, COVID-19, and uh, I can use at least three things that have been put on the table. One of them was the go-ahead for banks to actually sit down and look at um, um, accommodating uh, fresh terms or re having clients be able to renegotiate the loan terms. The other is the fact that they've also allowed uh, a moratorium on the federal government loans 
the, the, the government assisted loans by one year. And then there's also the 50 billion fund that's been um, uh, managed through NERSO. So I think, yes, there have been responses from the government, but maybe um, the questions may, could be whether or not this would be sufficient for the kind of um, um, uh, uh, results that we need, but certainly there has been a response. Uh, in terms of the wealth business, it's, it's like I said, it's been very disruptive in certain ways, but at the same time, I've also learned that within such disruptions also do come opportunities. Uh, I remember on the first um, um, a panel, I mean, there were conversations around what clients should be doing in terms of asset classes and where they should be putting money into. And the reality is that, yes, we've seen yields, for example, on treasury bill rates um, um, high at some point, dropped to less than uh, uh, 4% right now. Uh, but at the same time, we've also seen yields on uh, some of the sovereign euro bonds uh, also go up during that period. Um, we've seen the, the NSE all share index uh, move from about 29,000 uh, point, uh, points at the, in January to 20,000, which is almost a 30% loss, but that's also going back up. So I guess the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that yes, it's, it's a very disruptive situation, but the, the response and the advice to most clients is that this is also the time that's most important for you to be very deliberate in terms of your strategy. This is the time that it's most important for you to be able to sit down with your private bank or your advisor and reevaluate your goals. I don't think it's the time for people to panic. Yes, certainly it's brought in a lot of uh, distortion. It's brought in a lot of hardship. The wealth of our clients are basically driven to the resource economy, whether we like it or not. So when the prices of oil moves down from what it was at the end of last year at $67 roughly to um, what happened in April where it hit as low as uh, $14 or even lower at some point, then clearly this has implications for wealth. But I guess to summarize my response to you, it's also about keeping focused during these times and also being deliberate in terms of the decisions and also relying on very competent advice rather than having a knee-jerk reaction. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Yusuf, any thoughts, additional thoughts in that um, area? What are you telling your clients? What are your clients saying to you? Yeah, uh, for us, um, just like I said earlier, the, uh, the focus of the, our clients for now, and also in terms of the reactions that we've had is, now, when it comes to the periods of uncertainty, you can never rule out volatility. And what we've seen um, in, ma in major markets across the world is instances where you saw markets tanking uh, globally um, around the April when the, at the height of the lockdown. Um, right now, what you've seen is that the, um, those different ex um, assets are already climbing up backwards. And just like Mr. Thompson said earlier, when it comes to uh, periods of volatility, you, you always want to um, run away from having knee jack reactions. So it's very important for us, what we tell our clients at that point in time is, yeah, uncertainties are here and volatilities will come with it. And in the midst of those volatility, you always have opportunity. Um, and that's more or less the, what is really playing out at this point in time. And if I give an instance of what you saw um, on the Nigerian equities market, for instance, you have just in one month in um, April, where you, um, the market lost um, almost 18 percent just in April, and uh, before you know it, in, in, in May, the uh, market recorded some gains. And also, if we pick the um, the um, Nigeria fixed income market, you look at the bonds. Um, at some point, the, the the instruments were trading at above 14 percent. Right now, most of those instruments are even trading below 10 percent. It just shows that um, during those periods of volatility, things things like that you get to see them. But um, what um, we've always advised our clients is you don't need um, major reactions to um, uncertainty, but to take very um, defined and definite steps when it comes to asset reallocation or taking steps to um, make an investment. Thank you. Uh, how long do you think this would take? You know, not taking a knee-jerk reaction, basically 
to my mind means we wait, see how it goes before we take an action. But in the midst of that, do some planning and maybe reallocation of assets. How long do you think this should take and um, what should clients be expecting? Yeah, in terms, you know, um, at different times, at this different strategy sessions that we've sat in, um, questions that have always ar ar arisen is, arising is, are we looking at a V-shape, U-shape, or a W-shape recovery? Um, and from the look of things, I think we'll likely be looking at more of a V or U-shape recovery. Um, and um, by virtue of that, what we eventually get to be seeing is that all those, um, the lows that was recorded in April might probably be the lowest that we're going to see when it comes to um, instruments that are exchange traded. I'm, I'm talking of fixed income and equities now. Um, we might likely not be seeing those um, lows that we saw um, at the height of um, complete lockdown. Um, I'm not, we, although we still, we still uh, have it in the news of um, um, lockdowns in, um, in certain parts of the world still um, going to happen again. Um, in this part of the world, we are not hearing um, um, comments around another round of lockdown. And if uh, we do not see such, then the likelihood is that um, we're likely going to be seeing more level of stability going forward in terms of the responses of an influx of investors into, into the market. Because the, um, the reaction that we saw earlier is more reacting to um, the, the measures, the ex ex extensive measures that are put in place to, to curb um, the, the spread of COVID-19. And if such extensive measures are being relaxed and people are going back to, to their businesses, um, then we are likely going to see gradually um, an increase in the GDP growth and economic activity. Um, even the CBN governor also said that he's not expecting a recession, which is um, back to back decline in um, GDP growth over two quarters. So if we are seeing people gradually going back to work, then the likelihood is that we're likely not going to be seeing the, 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 the lows in terms of the market asset prices that we saw um, earlier on in the year. So from now, I, I, I believe we should be seeing more of stability going forward if there are no further restrictions to movement and lockdowns. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you so much for that. And may, Paul, maybe I'll just ask you a question at this point around you know, just the preservation of wealth and your communication with you know, your stakeholders. Um, so you're a successful business owner. You have offices in Lagos, London, Nairobi, Johannesburg, and London. I don't know how well those have fared during this period or whether they've also had similar experiences as we've discussed here. But what are your concerns from a wealth preservation point of view as you lead Landmark Africa through this cycle? Thank, thank you. And very interesting perspective from, um, from Mr. Yusuf. Um, as I said earlier in the, in the conversation, we represent the people in the trenches. So I'll speak from a practical point of view, from a practitioner's point of view. Um, so, so there's something we use that mirrors your three T's of transparency, trust, and, and I think it was the truth. Yes. Um, and we call it our four C's. And we, we use that to sort of, as a gauge, figure out how we respond to, to this pandemic and the resulting economic crisis, which, which, by the way, I think is a lot deeper than many people think. Um, we, we learned from Hurricane Katrina that you can't tell how devastating the effects of something like this is until about six to 12 months after, after it. And I've seen many, many um, pundits um, say that it may be 2021, 2022 before there's a full recovery. But um, when I talk about the four Cs, so that's communication, credit, colleagues, and, and customers. And from a communication standpoint of view, um, we've, you know, we have multiple stakeholders. So we engaged all our stakeholders. We tried to explain the state of play. We, we had virtual press conferences and we tried to source more information about the pandemic and the resultant effects of it and, and communicated our view. And from a credit point of view, as, as uh, Mr. Yewale um, um, said, it was very, it's very important to ensure that your cash flows remain strong. Um, so we've had to ne negotiate a whole series of contracts and conserve our cash flow, cut costs in various areas, and arrange standby credit um, to go on. I think this this um, 
crisis is certainly longer than three months or it's already four months and it's likely to be six to seven months. Um, we, we, we live in a country where the numbers are going up rather than down. So even though there's been a gradual lock uh, release, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there's another lockdown. The, from a colleague's point of view, um, we, we obviously the health and well-being of our colleagues are important. The welfare of our colleagues are important. We try to ensure job security. The, over 1,200 people worked within the landmark ecosystem and before the, the COVID struck. Um, obviously, that's great, greatly reduced. Um, we set up WhatsApp groups. We've had sort of virtual town hall meetings. We've arranged social events. And we, did, we restructured our team into sort of three sections, the wartime team, the work from home team, and the team that will stay on leave until, on the, until the crisis is over. From a customer point of view, obviously the health and safe, safety is important. So we've gone about arranging infrastructural changes within our environment from touchless doors and things like that. Um, signs to advise people. We have all the sort of sanitizer and the face masks um, uh, man, mandate, mandation. Uh, we, we've had to make commercial concessions in various areas, whether it's rent rebates or, or or payment plans or, or lease cycles. And we've, we've, had to, we've communicated with our clients through sort of newsletters. So, so a lot has been going on, even though very little has been going on. And as, and as you probably know, um, because our ecosystem was quiet and had virtually ground to halt, and to put it into perspective, six months ago, we had, um, in December, we had 320,000 visitors to the landmark destination. Um, in the month of June, we had under 6,000 visitors. Um, so that puts into play how, how serious um, this has been to, to our business. So the, the, those are the sorts of things we've been doing over the time. Um, and because our business was quiet and we decided to contribute to, to um, at least society or the community. Um, so we, we teamed up with, with YPO under the sort of governance of Lagos State and set up an isolation center um, that, that hopefully will help flatten this curve. Uh, and, and so far, I, I understand it's done quite well. Yeah, well done on that, Paul. I think that was impressive as well. Um, and I mean, hearing he, you, I mean, there's so much I think I'm learning as well from here, but um, your thoughts around um, communication, cash flows, colleagues and customers definitely resonates with some of what we're also seeing other clients do. Um, but what I wanted to you know, just um, turn, stream down on or focus on is around um, the role of technology. Um, do you see that playing a role to enhance or disrupt the real estate sector? Oh, ab absolutely. Both a disruption and an enhancement. So the disruption um, sometimes is positive rather than negative. Um, so, so one of the things that the real estate sector hasn't done and will be forced to do, and is being forced to do during this crisis, is embrace technology and sort of digitize its services a lot, a lot more. Obviously, because this crisis is about social distancing, and real estate is a is a is a platform that brings people together, then real estate needs to find a way of meeting the people um, virtually as opposed to just physically. And so, so in terms of selling real estate, in terms of of designing it, in terms of assessing it, in in terms of um, the whole life cycle of the value chain from, from buying the land to construction to, to maintenance and management and sales and after sales and financing. Um, the, that digital model, bringing technology into it should, should, should work and should play a huge mm -hmm. part. Yeah, uh, well, I, I think, Paul, you know, what I'm also kind of concerned about is with the current structures that you have on ground, you know, I don't know to what extent, you know, the contract modifications or adjustments have gone, but do you see that, you know, um, maybe lease agreements have been terminated because um, offices recognize that they don't need as much space um, or, you know, adjusted to accommodate the reality on ground. And if you already have those spaces, you know, what's the future for them? It's a very, very good question, Siri, and, and we, we've seen a lot of that, and some of it is, is panic, some of it, some, some people will terminate or reduce their, their exposure just on the basis that there's a pandemic and they found sort of more, more um, efficient ways of working either from home and which require less space, but, but organizations like ours have to be flexible and we, we have to be agile. And, and create sustainable ways of working. So, so even though the need for real estate will reduce, one hopes with digitizing the economy and this whole 
um, technology platform, it will increase the number of businesses around and increase the number of people that need space. So even if each organization needs less space and there are more organizations that need space, one would believe, one would hope that that they will subscribe to real estate. So that's one positive way of looking at it. Another way, obviously, is, is just making sure that the space is flexible enough. So whether it's, you know, as I, as, as you know, we, we operate a business leisure lifestyle philosophy. So whether it's a residential play or, or a commercial play or, or an infrastructure play or educational or, or retail, um, your spa the space has to be flexible enough to meet all comers and meet various sectors of the demand. And so, yeah. So there's there's some concern, um, but not too much concern. I think every every there are no there are no roses without thorns, as they say. So it's I think it's important to to ensure that we we get the good, even if we do have some of the bad. Yeah, um, um, Ijo, would you think you need a, a big office still, a big building? <laughs> Well, uh, big is a very relative word, um, but I think clearly one of the things that um, COVID-19 has thrown up to us is also the need to also drive businesses a lot more efficiently. Uh, what I can see though is that, I mean, for a bank like First Bank, um, it's been quite fortunate that the executive leadership actually had a digital agenda well ahead of COVID and I think that has helped in many ways. Uh, but regardless to answer your questions, it's, it's a mixed answer. Yes, you do need the office space, but um, maybe not necessarily in terms of the sizes, um, uh, depending on the kind of businesses you operate. And why do I say so? I mean, the role of technology, like we all agree, it covers many things from driving your efficiencies, from being able to enhance your client engagement, to being able to even produce the kind of revenue results you want, um, looking at your bottom line. But the, what we also need to recognize is that we also deal with clients who are at different stages, life stages. So it's not every single person that embraces technology. For the kind of business I run, um, I, I need to be very, very bespoke in terms of how I relate to clients. So for the more elderly clients, you are less um, uh, inclined to want to use an app, for example. Uh, clearly, the engagement has to take place within the confines of the office. And then secondly, um, for me to be able to have a proper and intuitive conversation with a client on a portfolio that's, um, let's say, it's declining, there are also limits to which that can be done over uh, a Zoom call or a Microsoft Teams call, right? So yes, clearly we may not need the kind of spaces we have in terms of commercial spaces, but we also still need the platform to be able to engage our clients on a very personable level. Yeah, awesome. Um, I, I don't know if your private banking lounge, you probably have one. But um, do you think, just giving your predictions, do you think we would be shifting more to high tech and less high touch in relationship management as you work with your clients? And uh, like I alluded to at the beginning, I think it'd be very um, inconceivable for an organization not to have an agenda for its technology. And uh, the world moves very quickly. I mean, we saw the way the market was transformed with mobile technology and how the, the density just soared high in Nigeria. It's the same thing that would happen in many areas. Um, I, I, well, I, I think it's, it's uh, again, it's a bit of a difficult um, question to respond to, but it's also very situational. Um, I, I think that, um, Going forward, we probably would see a lot more in terms of mobile apps, for example, uh, doing a lot more in the wealth space. Uh, we'll, we'll probably see a lot more in terms of convenience-driven um, automated transactions. Uh, we're going to see a lot more in terms of, hopefully in my space, uh, use of algorithms for uh, things like your financial planning, being able to set up predictive scenarios, look at where you'd be 60, whatever, the age of 60, 70, and then run those kind of models that you are able to run in the more developed markets. So yes, there's a whole lot that um, 
I feel we would see going down the line. Um, but there's also the concern, which I would want to quickly flag around things that relate to cybersecurity, because as quickly as we want to embrace technology, we also have to be mindful that there's also a responsibility to ensure that um, our clients' records are also properly protected. Uh, globally, you have um, the UK, you have things like the GDPR, in Nigeria, you have the NDPR. Maybe not as enforced the way it should be yet, but clearly there's a responsibility on the bank to ensure that, and technology does has its risk in that area. So it's just one area that banks and uh, wealth managers uh, clearly need to put a lot more focus. Thank you so much, Joe. That was very insightful, especially I like your point on cybersecurity, not one that many advisors consider as well. Um, but just before I go on to Mr. Oyewole, I'd like to just encourage participants to use the Slido hashtag PBWMS to ask questions from the speakers. Um, so Mr. Oyewole, you know, let's just touch base on, you know, what you're advising clients still. Um, this is a session of telling the truth and, you know, it touches around on almost everything from the way we manage relationships to even the spaces and our workforce as well, how we manage or handle them. But I think the most important asset, especially for these clients as well, is just what's generating um, income for them. So, um, Ultra high net worth individuals are generally immune to shorter term swings, they say. But um, from your experience, whether this is true for Nigeria is another thing. Do you think this is true, taking into consideration, you know, how government policies have um, interfered and also consider the foreign exchange rate fluctuations? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, the, I think certainly it's not correct that um, ultra high net worth individuals are generally moved from short term swings. Um, the, the reality, as I see from my clients, is that um, most of them tend to be, um, they have a lot of assets, but not um, a lot of liquidity. So they tend to be very severely impacted from a liquidity point of view um, when problems arise. And where you're in a situation where everybody has liquidity problems, even if you have the assets, it's not easy for you to liquidate those assets to generate cash. So um, a lot of uh, our clients have been, certainly been negatively affected in the short term, and um, they are looking for, the, for different ways. Now, um, I know the, um, there's been the suggestion that there's government support and things like that, but what we tend to find out that even accessing those government support schemes tend to be very difficult and cumbersome um, processes. And it's not something you need quickly where if I cannot make my payroll this month, um, I don't have the time to go through any government scheme to generate cash to pay my payroll at the end of the month. So um, our clients are generally um, looking at to say, where does cash come from? Now, although people keep saying, oh, the government is the bulk of the economy, most of the cash comes from the economy. I don't think that is correct, actually true for most of our clients. Um, a lot, um, there, yes, there's some clients in certain sectors that are dependent on government policy and government spending, um, but th those are some specific sectors. But where you have, um, if you look at the GDP of the country, the bulk of the GPD, GP, GDP of the country is in services and in agriculture, which is not doesn't directly re require government spending. And the main um, struggle has been to ensure that the cash is flowing within 
um, those um, environments um, so that, um, sorry, please. Um, sorry for the interruption. Um, we, we, the whole, the main thing is that most clients are looking at is ensuring that they get paid um, yeah. by their um, counterparties on time because as they are also trying to conserve cash, the counterparties are conserving cash. So you tend to see the delays in payments and disputes of, of course, arise out of that. So um, it's how to manage those issues that keep coming up. Um, obviously also um, there are employment issues where in trying to uh, cut costs, clients need to look at and say, okay, what are our employment obligations? How can we, are we, can we let go of staff? Can we put staff on half salary? Can we put staff on leave without pay? Um, those all create all sorts of legal issues that the clients are worried mm -hmm. about. But um, I think like Paul said, everybody, you, they, they, they manage um, in a practical way. It's, it's no longer theory. It's what can you do to, and, or what can you get away with, so to speak. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's helpful, and I think your response kind of fits in nicely to the question I was going to ask um, Mr. Taiwo Yusuf around, you know, what tools you are helping clients at this time. What tools are you advising clients on to help preserve their capital? Something um, Mr. Yuwoli mentioned was around cash, and just making sure that that's even available for events as they come up, whether it's payroll management or even managing um, service or vendor, um, uh, service providers or your vendors. So what tools are you typically helping clients with at this time? And um, would you just also touch on diversification as well as you speak to that? Uh, a model that okay. works. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'll speak from the perspective of investment. Um, Number one, um, while we talk about the period, this sort of periods, and um, we know that cash is king, um, one thing that we also have to realize is that you also have to put yourself on a good pedestal for emerging um, from this this period. Um, I'll give I'll give a perspective to that. Um, in, uh, maybe this is more or less um, referring to the Nigerian situation in 2016 when, when we had the recession. Um, immediately, and uh, of course, so many um, households, consumers, businesses have to readjust to the new reality of um, um, a higher inflationary uh, period and also a higher exchange rate um, from what we, we used to know it to be. So throughout 2016, the country went into a recession. Well, immediately in 2017, what we noticed was that the, the, the markets, um, after the readjustment that people and businesses have to do, um, if I take the, exchange, um, the stock exchange market as a proxy, what we noticed immediately afterwards was, was almost a 50% return on the all share index for 2017. Now, even though while we'll be, we may be talking about um, the realities of today and uh, what we need to do to conserve and um, capital, we also have to be mindful of what kind of investments that we need to do um, to emerge stronger um, from the effect of this um, pandemic. Um, for us, um, we, we've also, we, we, one of the things that we, we do discuss with our clients we, um, uh, goes around diversification, um, even though we know that um, on an historical perspective, if you look at Naira return um, on a compounded basis, um, on the basis of the kind of return that the Naira uh, and Treasury bill and bonds have had in, in the last 20 years, you could always say that probably holding your assets in Naira can give you um, a higher return compared to on a compounded basis over a period of 10 to uh, 10 years or, or more, um, compared to you holding dollar assets. But right now, um, by virtue of the kind of returns that Naira is having, yeah, um, and uh, depending on how 
sustainable the the way to be at this kind at this rate at this level of below four or below double DJ rates that Naira is currently experiencing. Um, that time might be changing looking forward. And so for us, some of the things that we'll do, um, uh, advise our clients to do is just as much as uh, you have the Naira assets locked in um, strategic investment. Also, is also there is a need for diversification into um, other asset classes or um, other um, currencies beyond Naira. And I'll also give a perspective to that. Um, for, a, for a very slight period during um, this, just during this period as well, in the last two months, we witnessed dollar assets at some point, the euro bonds, for instance, trading at 12, 13% at some point, although it's coming down right now. But you still have dollar asset that you could hold at double digits compared to Naira asset that gives you just um, at the brink of the double digit as well. So on a comparison basis, so there is a need for us to diversify assets um, across the different um, um, across different currencies. And also um, locally as well, when you're looking at um, businesses that um, are some of the things that we do encourage our clients to do is also um, um, around the liquidity, which has to do with um, maybe um, having some discussion around bridge financing. Uh, when it comes to um, sustaining the businesses, especially for business that are added um, with, uh, with, with COVID and um, that hardly generate cash or even have any revenue during this period. So speaking um, strictly from this um, investment for us, it is more of um, cash is king and also how to emerge stronger in terms of the decisions that we make now, in terms of its kind of assets that we encourage okay. our clients to put their funds into such that they can much stronger and um, generate okay. uh, very good returns by the time we are talking in the next 12 months. Okay, I've, I've got a question for you from the audience. How do you expect the fixed income space in both advanced and other economies to react if there was a second wave of the virus? Yeah, from the from experience, what, we, what I, I've seen and what um, any investment banker will tell you is at any period in time when there is um, um, what I would call risk uh, risk risk on. Um, at that point in time, most what happens mo most times is that you see is a flight to safety. Um, so more or less the same thing that we we'll get to see if there is another wave of um, um, uh, lockdowns. What we're likely going to see is that this uh, more or less what will be, what's, what is similar to what we saw in April. There will be a, um, a, a rush to safety. And when, those, when, when such happens, what we normally see is prices um, coming down. And I'll, just to explain that further a little bit, just like I explained earlier, for the fixed income market in, uh, in, uh, in April, we saw instruments, Nigeria-based bonds trading at 14%. Now they are trading at they are below 10%. And if you look at that in terms of capital gain, that's 26, almost 30 percent in terms of capital gain under two months. So when you do have waves and periods of uncertainties and volatility, there is opportunity in between. So to answer the question directly, if there is another wave, what we're likely going to see is prices coming down again. But for any savvy investor, you just have to know probably that you, you need to make some profitable okay. decision at that point in time. All right. Thank you so much. I've got a question for Ido. Um, yeah, so how do we solve the cyber challenges to prevent loss of funds? Uh, well, um, the, 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 the cyber challenge, it's um, again, that, that, that's an issue that needs to be managed by uh, the technology team from each institution. Um, and I will give a, a, a clear example, even for something as simple as running an online banking platform. I mean, there are lots of things that go behind the scenes to ensure that um, client records are safe. Uh, so my advice to um, the person who asked the question is, um, it's more about dealing with a, a name with a good reputation and which you also know has good standards in that area. 
Um, managing your cyber risk also means that you should also not allow yourself to be compromised. Um, being on the internet, be careful how you share your password. You're not meant to share your passwords. Be careful the kind of sites you go into. Uh, some of those sites may be cloned. Um, be careful on things that are requesting personal information. Uh, they're clearly no-nos if they're not verified but I think a lot more of the responsibility, like I said, also lies on the institutions uh, themselves to be able to provide the ne necessary protection uh, for the records on their servers in terms of uh, the, 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 the kind of emails that come in, how they're filtered, and also to prevent uh, actions or attempts at things like phishing, scams, and, and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank but it's you. something to live with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think I'll just, we're out of time. I'll just get a few last words from all the panelists. I have a specific question for Paul, and he's going to have to rate how service providers have um, done or fared during this period, whether advisors or private bankers and lawyers as well. And you'll be the last to speak, Paul. So let me start with Mr. Oyewale, just final words as we close. Um. I think my final word is that um, anybody who wants to do, uh, maybe I think I'm maybe the wrong person to say this, but I would say that um, I tell my clients that they need to think for themselves and should not rely on their advisors. That is, they need to um, educate themselves on the risks and things. So my role is to educate them on the risks and the options, but at the end of the day, it's the clients who take the decision. So the clients need to be informed. And I think that's one of the things that I try, always try to tell my clients that um, I'm there to help them and be alongside them, but I cannot um, make their decisions for them. So the clients need to be encouraged to, um, be educated on a lot of these issues that we're talking about. Thank you so much. So please for education. Ito, last words? Well, my last words will be to my clients to um, um, stay um, focused in terms of their long-term goals, uh, make a distinction between what's going to be a tactical response as against what would be your strategic reaction to what's going on. Be aware of the opportunities the market has created and indeed there are opportunities. And lastly, uh, do recognize that I hate using the word new normal, but I feel that this is something that we have to continue to live with over time and we all need to come to terms with it. Uh, I, I don't think that there's I mean, people express worries around Nigeria and stuff. I, I don't think uh, the US in itself or other countries offshore are also necessarily safe havens, havens in, 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 in that regard. So it's about being having a global view, but also being locally aware. Thank you. Yeah, like that, global and locally aware. Thank you, Taiwo. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, what uh, for me for the last word is more of um, we do not have control as regards what will happen in terms of uh, periods of uncertainties. Period like this will come and go. But what is very important is for us to make decisions um, during this kind of period that will put us in very good stead um, when 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 the tide, when the tide passes over. So for me, it is to advise um, investors and clients that decisions should be made for, for long time and not um, short time when it comes to periods like this. Thank you. Thank you, very useful point to do long term rather than short term, I like that. And um, Paul, this is your time to just pretty much assess how you've um, kind of fared with advisors, private bankers and lawyers during this period and what would be your one thing that you'd like to see different as we go in this period and for the future, locally speaking. All right, thank, thank you, Siri. I mean, well, in terms of my experience with, with bankers, lawyers, and, and other advisors, um, and it would range really from about three on a scale of one to 10 to about eight. 
And, um, and, and I say that advisedly in that I think a lot of organizations have tried to suck their way through this. And so it, it, it came as a surprise. And, and I think organizations and advice are getting better. I'm sure most of you have experienced some of the banking issues during this period of time. Some of them, to say the least, have been frustrating, but um, it's improving. In, in terms of my, my one advice, I'm going to go a little bit off tangent and I'm going to echo something um, uh, Mr. Thompson said in terms of the new norm. I know, I know, I know you don't like using that word, um, but I think this is a problem. This pand the, the economic crisis caused by this pandemic is a problem that not, the private sector can't solve alone. And I think there's a government responsibility as well. So whilst the private sector should you know, digitize and embrace technology, use, embrace the remote culture, you know, health and well-being, and you know, introduce more rigor and, ex and excellence into our services. Um, but the government, I think, need from a general perspective, they need, a, you know, we need, they need to develop a stronger political will to make a change. And um, they need to embrace the sort of public-private sector partnerships. They need to be a lot more selfless leadership in, at times like this because it's a big crisis. There needs to be a strong cultural service. But most importantly, there needs to be a, an Olympic mindset to the to setting up infrastructure. Um, so not just anything will do in, in our society. Um, and lastly, I would say the regulatory tyranny just needs to, it needs a little bit of a cap on it. Um, there's, there's far too much regulation at a period of far too much pain um, where there's so much scarcity. So, so I, I think you know, that old chestnut of the ease of doing business needs to be embraced a little bit. A lot of treatable moments there. Um, and I'm glad that we're doing this with Business Day. So Business Day, over to you. Please ensure that you publicize all of this comment. We do need strong reinforcement of some of the points that have been made here. And I do see the need for a stronger affiliation between the public and private sector. The private sector can't do this all alone. Um, and so thank you for those words. And thank you to all of my panelists. This has been an engaging session. Um, and over to you, Rolly. Thank you so much. Bye. Yes, Siri, thank Rally. you very much. Um, and thank you for the mandate uh, to uh, Business Day. We, 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 we got the message. Uh, Paul talks about um, excessive uh, regulatory tyranny in a time of... Uh, um, of, of considerable pain. And, and I think um, in those very few words, a lot of um, emotion is, 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 is packed. But I'd like to thank our speakers, our panelists, our moderators for a wonderful session that we have had today. And particularly, uh, particularly uh, uh, um, uh, I would like to commend the very good time management adopted by our panelists, I mean, by our moderators, um, Isiri uh, uh, and, and the others, including Yewande, uh, who moderated uh, the first session. We are indeed very grateful. Would like to thank our audience for staying with us, quite um, a number of people, at some point 200 by Zoom and uh, more than 200 on the YouTube uh, uh, um, live um, uh, uh, session as well. We think this is, very important. We took the point about um, how it is that the private sector alone cannot do this and that, that, that there is significant uh, a place for the government. Um, we have seen um, government stimulus around the world and we know how very uh, uh, um, marginal uh, what we have seen uh, uh, in Nigeria. Altogether, we had uh, three uh, different uh, sessions. The first one we called a cockpit, which focused on how fundamentally um, the dynamics of private banking and wealth management in Nigeria uh, are changing. Uh, we also looked at the threats and the opportunities as well. The second session focused on portfolio rebalancing, diversification, and of course, deployment of strategy in short to medium term. And the final session moderated by a series uh, looked at uh, how firms are stepping up their game in the area of relationship management and how they are deploying new tools for a very, very uncertain and indeed for a time like we have never seen before. Now, let me thank our 
sponsors. But before I do that, I think it is fair to acknowledge that the inspiration to do this came from uh, Titi of Sankore. And so I'd like to, um, I don't know whether she's still on the line, I'd like to um, acknowledge the uh, help uh, in, in this very regard and also um, to um, pay our own gratitude to Sankore uh, Investment for uh, uh, the support. We also thank Investment One, Platform Capital, and our friend, um, Dr. Kendele. We thank ICO Capital, and of course, uh, Blackbridge Wealth uh, for helping um, to sponsor to this event. I'd like also to mention uh, our friend Martin, who joined in from Switzerland, and of course, uh, Bingbe, who joined in from the United Kingdom as panelists uh, for today. I can assure you, Business Day will continue um, to convene important um, top leadership events like this so we can share insights. Um, and I like the idea of having Paul, um, who uh, in very, very few words was able to um, share with us the pain and the frustration he's going through uh, at a time like this. I wish you well, Paul, um, as I wish all others who have joined this call well. Once again, thank you so much from Business Day. God bless you and God bless Nigeria.